Ready? Thank you. The committee will come to order. Before I begin, and I don't think that I have to remind the audience broadly, but I will, decorum will be maintained here so that our two witnesses, both seated governors, are heard without any unreasonable interruption. If you agree with them, smile. If you disagree with them, smile. The fact is that this is about America hearing from two governors who have a high responsibility to serve their states, and we have a high responsibility to hear them. The Chair cannot allow any disruptions, and I appreciate that all those who came to get a message out did so before the gavel, and I appreciate that you would, if you would like to remain, you can remain for the entire hearing. We are open to the public. But if there is any disruption, your seats will go to the people waiting outside who also would like to be in attendance. This committee has a longstanding uh, history of doing that on a bipartisan basis. Uh, I now recognize the uh, ranking member for unanimous consent. I ask uh, unanimous, unanimous consent. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Unanimous consent uh, that Representative Gwen Moore of the 4th District of Wisconsin be permitted to attend in this hearing pursuant to Rule 11, Section 2G2C, and ask questions of the witnesses. Per, per our rule, without objection, so ordered. The Oversight Committee's mission statement is that we exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the government oversight and uh, the government oversight reform, <laughs> on the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, it's only my committee, is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people, bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the government, of this is the mission of Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Today's hearing continues the Committee's effort to examine crises brought on by out-of-control spending and mounting debt at the State level. And let me assure you, that is not to say every State is out of control. But virtually every State in the Union and many localities have increased their debt load at a time in which debt service is at an all-time low. The American people are well aware of the fiscal crisis Washington faces on a national level. They are ready for Congress to cut spending, and even President Obama has lauded recent spending cuts cap uh, championed by the House Republicans. What is less known is that the severe fiscal problems that some of our States and municipal governments face. Already this year, our financial, system, our financial Services Subcommittee, under the leadership of Chairman Patrick McHenry, has done a great service by highlighting problems created by some irresponsible spending. I thank Chairman McHenry for his efforts. The facts we have learned from the Subcommittee are telling. Currently, States face a combined budget shortfall of roughly $112 billion for fiscal year 2012, an amount equal to approximately one-fifth of their budgets. That, if nothing is done, will pile on more debt for the future. The evidence why this has occurred is clear. Since 1990, State and local government spending has increased 70 percent faster than inflation. When the recession hit, State and local tax revenues simply no longer sustain that growth. Looming just around the corner, unfunded or underfunded, pension liabilities pose a daunting threat to State and municipal budgets. This burdens taxpayers with an estimated $3 trillion in debt. I say estimated because nobody knows the full exposure that taxpayers have due. The, the fact that 
the bond markets are not transparent uh, and the reporting rules do not force adequate dis disclosure. Additionally, as we have seen here, when we have talked about the correct amounts to be withheld for our postal carriers, we find that the, there is up to $5.5 billion of dis or excuse me, after, up to $6.5 trillion, billion, up to six, I'm not, it's not on the script, folks, so bear with me, up to $6.5 billion of discrepancy between two opposing sides on this issue. <clears throat> Indeed, over the past 20 years, State and local governments have promised uh, to government workers that they knew they could not keep in some cases, hoping that future wealth would continue to propel them. Today we have two governors with us, and we are pleased to welcome Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker and Vermont Governor Peter Shumlin. They come from two very different states, one larger, one smaller, one in the midst of a tough downturn that may in fact continue for a very long time as many of the core industries that have created wealth begin to change, and that transition may be long and painful. Vermont, on the other hand, a wonderful state filled with a great deal of industry that may be facing challenges today, but are likely to be slightly less systemic than what Wisconsin faces. This doesn't change the fact that both governors are dealing with the issues of shortfalls in their own way, and today we look forward to hearing how they are going to retain the viability of their state long after their terms have ended. Unionized Federal workers uh, don't even have collective bargaining rights. Governor Walker's bold reforms seem reasonable to those of us in Washington who understand that our retirement and health care system at the Federal level is not subject to collective bargaining, that, in fact, it is based on a single system, uniform throughout the Federal workforce, and not debatable as to withholding or as to the benefits. That is not to say that Federal workers don't have a good program. They do. But their program has been based on a long list of uh, requests considered by Congress and funded. So as we deal with Federal issues, hopefully we deal with State issues who in many cases have less room to maneuver, are looking for more room to maneuver, and believe that they can achieve it through uh, changes in their laws. Lastly, the insolvency of Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain, most often called the pigs, tells us that States within a greater union can, in fact, be a challenge for the Union. The, the independent countries of Europe that belong to the European Union are more loosely configured than our own States. That means that if we have insolvency in three, four, five of our States, we have a greater challenge to our common nation than does the European Union. And yet, the European Union has been constantly trying to figure out ways to maintain these States within the European Union help them bail themselves out and, in fact, insist that they uh, change uh, policies that have gotten into this problem. We are not here today to intervene in the sovereign States that are before us. We are here to understand what they are doing in self-help. With that, I recognize the Ranking Member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I ask unanimous uh, consent that the statement of the National Education associated dated April 14, 2011, be admitted into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I strongly support efforts to help States continue their economic recovery and eliminate the budget shortfalls caused by the most severe financial crisis since the Great Depression. Many States have been forced to make significant cuts in their budgets, trimming critical programs that help our Nation's veterans assist the developmentally disabled, supply health care services to the poor, and provide nursing home services to our seniors. These are difficult decisions, and I have great respect for our governors who are able to work with governmental and nongovernmental entities to develop innovative ways to preserve as many services as possible for their citizens while making fiscally responsible choices. However, I strongly oppose efforts to falsely blame middle class American workers for these current economic problems. We know better than anybody else in this committee 
why those problems came about. This recession was not caused by them. Working America, firefighters, teachers, and nurses, and so many others, who are, in the words of the theologian Swindle, are so often unseen, unnoticed, unappreciated, and unapplauded, are not responsible for the reckless actions of Wall Street, which led to this crisis in the first place. I also strongly object to efforts by politicians who try to use current economic downturn to strip American workers of their rights. Mr. Chairman, we are a country who has consistently increased rights, not taken them away. As a matter of fact, if it were not for that principle, I would not be sitting here today and the women in this Congress would not be sitting here today. The right to negotiate working conditions that are safe, the right to negotiate due process protections against being fired arbitrarily, and the right to negotiate fair pay for an honest day's work. Today's hearing is a study in contrast. We are very fortunate to have with us two State Governors, Governor Shumlin from Vermont and Governor Walker from Wisconsin, and we are glad to have them. Both face budget shortfalls this year, but they approach the rights of workers in drastically different ways. Governor Shulman of Vermont faced a budget shortfall, ladies and gentlemen, of about $176 million for fiscal year 2012. He negotiated with State employees who accepted a two-year, 3 percent pay cut. Vermont teachers also agreed to work uh, three additional years before retiring and to contribute more towards their pensions. And the Vermont State Employees Association voted to increase their pension contribution by 1.3 percent over the next five years. In addition to obtaining these concessions, Governor Schumann also did something else. He proposed spreading additional cuts across various State agencies, as well as raising additional revenue through select surcharges and assessments. In other words, he developed a plan to spread out and share sacrifices across the State. And we should note that those employees went along with it because they, too, wanted to strengthen their own State's fiscal situation. Governor Walker took a very different approach in Wisconsin. He faced a projected shortfall of $137 million in the current fiscal year. Within days of the Governor's announcing a budget proposal to address this shortfall, labor leaders in Wisconsin agreed to accept all of his financial demands. They agreed to increase their pension contributions more than 20-fold and they agreed to double their share of the health insurance premiums. But Governor Walker did not accept these concessions. Instead, he went much further by attempting to strip government employees of their collective bargaining rights. He demanded numerous provisions that had nothing to do with the State's budget and had no fiscal impact. For example, he wanted to require unions to hold annual votes to continue representing their members, and he wanted to prevent employees from paying union dues through their paychecks. Governor Walker refused to meet with, with union leaders, and he declared publicly that he would not negotiate with them. One of the big questions we uh, will have of Governor Walker today is why did he not say yes to the unions when they agreed to meet all of his financial demands? And on a broader level, what is motivating this extreme effort to dismantle the unions themselves? In my opinion, it is shameful to play politics with American workers and their families these are real people, middle-class Americans, who are trying to put food on their table for their family, keep a roof over their heads, educate their children, and plan for retirement that does not burden their loved ones. We should be helping these workers, not attacking them, because they are the engine and the author of the American recovery. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the distinguished gentleman, subcommittee chairman, Patrick McHenry, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much for holding this hearing today. And, Governors, thank you for being here. Over the past two months, Congressman Quigley, who is a ranking member of my subcommittee, we have held hear hearings on State budgets and pensions and their impact on the municipal bond market. Two essential questions immediately stood out. First, what is the true debt burden facing our States and municipalities? And second, what must be done to mitigate the immediate crisis and put all forms of government back on a solvent fiscal trajectory? After holding hearings with scholars, State Senators, rating agencies, and other parties about State budgets and pensions, we confirmed what leading economists are predicting, 
and what we will hear from the testimony today, that 2012 will be one of the most difficult budget years for States and municipalities on record. Forty-four States in the District of Columbia are now projecting aggregate budget shortfalls totaling $112 billion for this year alone, and it only gets worse from here on out. If, it if that wasn't enough, there are uh, unfunded pension liabilities upwards of $3.2 trillion for States and $383 billion for local governments, some of which are, is kept off of States' accounting books, uh, representing trillions of dollars in shadow accounting. Today, some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will use the words like extreme, tax increases, and use those re words repeatedly um, to describe what is either happening in terms of cuts or what is necessary to get out of this situation. We are not facing a revenue problem. It is a spending problem. But as always, the numbers don't lie. Since 1990, State and local governments uh, have increased spending by roughly 70 percent faster than inflation. In addition to this unchecked, reckless spending, the looming burden of paying out trillions of dollars in lucrative public pensions and health care benefits leaves State and local governments in dire straits. I have stated before that there will be severe consequences if we are dishonest about the fiscal obligations before us and refuse to change course. The cost of inaction will be borne by the young teachers who are told that their cash-strapped school districts can no longer afford their retirement benefits because it must finance the exorbitant benefits of others. Many public servants, like firefighters and policemen, faced with the possibility that their vital jobs that they hold will no longer provide a standard of living for their families, will simply choose another career. In the end, the people who, that we count on to teach our children and to protect our homes and our families will realize that their government has failed them and actively hurt their retirement security. We have an opportunity to change that. Numerous States have seen the writing on the wall and decided to take action. In recent years, at least 15 States passed legislation to reform some aspect of their pension system. For example, Governor Mitch Daniels of Indiana successfully reformed collective bargaining, leading to more efficient and effective government. Governor Walker has boldly set out to push through similar initiatives in Wisconsin. We have seen this in the national news. Even in the face of extremely heated political attacks, uh, Governor Walker has uh, shown that he understands and has a genuine commitment to reform and to prevent this fiscal calamity. The Governor's proposals were recently welcomed by the bond market and Moody's, which said that Governor Walker's plan will have a positive effect on the credit rating of his State. In the end, that will mean less cost and less expense to his taxpayers in order to get lending. Change is never easy. But if we wish to ensure an honest retirement for those who teach our children or protect our families and leave the next generation a country as economically vibrant as the one that we inherited, we must be serious about the problems we face. It is our responsibility to be fair to our current retirees and honor our commitment to them, while at the same time not punishing the next generation of America for today's free spending ways. It is only possible if we take the necessary, necessary steps before it is too late. It is not too late. We still have the opportunity for change, and that is what this discussion here today is about. Moreover, in light of the hearings that we have had and the discussion we will hear today, I think it is important that taxpayers and, and the market generally have the transparency necessary to understand uh, the fiscal situation States are in. Taxpayers deserve it, those that are paying into the pensions deserve it, and the American people broadly deserve that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Thank you for your leadership. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman. And I thank him for what his subcommittee on a bipartisan basis has been doing on this matter. We now recognize his partner, the ranking member of the subcommittee on TARP, financial services and, and bailouts of public and private programs, Mr. Quigley, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank you for convening today's third hearing on State Municipal Debt. I would like to thank uh, the Chairman of the Subcommittee for his efforts in those first two committee meetings. I would also like to thank our six witnesses for contributing their time and expertise today. Uh, let me begin by saying, in the end, I do think we have a revenue problem, and the revenue problem at the local level was because of the economic downturn. Uh, it shrunk local 
government's revenues dramatically, as cities and states are like. So it was a revenue problem. Now, that doesn't mean that you, have, you should raise taxes, because uh, I understand where you are coming from, but raising taxes in a, during a recession is a bad idea. But we have to recognize that in the end, uh, this was in large part a revenue problem. Uh, so having addressed that, the other things we have learned in these hearings is that many States have these big challenges. Uh, and you don't have to tell me, I come from Illinois. Illinois failed to heed the Old Testament story that advised that one should save during the seven good years to survive during the seven lean years. While Illinois' current administration didn't dig the hole that it got, it has to move forward on substantive fiscal reform. Illinois and other States in similar situations owe it to their taxpayers to fix their budget. If States like Illinois and New Jersey and California don't get serious about reform, they will never be able to keep the basic promises they have made. Reform should be emphasizing reinventing, streamlining government and adapting to changing times. But reform should not demonize public sector workers who have dedicated their careers to government service. While States have the right to make their own policy, I strongly support collective bargaining rights for public sector workers, but recognize that we have to work together collectively to solve these problems. Collective bargaining rights didn't cause the recession, and curtailing them won't fix State budget deficits. What will fix State budget deficits are common sense reforms that restore budgets to a sustainable path. Consider public sector collective bargaining facts and figures. A simple calculation shows that States that allow public sector collective bargaining have an average projected 2012 deficit of 14 percent relative to their budgets. 14 percent is big, but States that forbid public sector collective bargaining have projected deficits at 16.5 percent. Either way you spend it, ending collective bargaining rights won't reduce budget deficits. Workers have to play a role to meet these fiscal realities. It is obvious we have to reduce deficits and long-term debt, but we shouldn't take advantage of the economic downturn to achieve longstanding ideological goals. Public sectors should continue to have collective bargaining rights, and we need to work together to achieve responsible reform. Soon I will be releasing Part 2 of a series of reports on reinventing our Federal budget. This reform will recommend over a trillion dollars in savings over the next 10 years. This report builds on Part 1 I released in November, but also on a series of reports I released as a Cook County Commissioner. I bring this up because I remember how frustrating it was to try to achieve substantive reform at the local level. The truth is these same frustrations are present here in Washington, but we can't let those frustrations get the better of us. States like Illinois need fiscal reform. We need to streamline, consolidate and reinvent government, not because it is unimportant but because its mission is so important. It is where the wheels hit the street. And if we can remember, the true heroes of 9-11 were civil service workers. That is why we should restore these local governments to sustainability rather than tear them down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair uh, will have the uh, sorry, members may have seven le legislative days in order to submit additional statements and extraneous material. We would now rec like to recognize our first panel of witnesses. No one on this side of the dais currently can introduce them as well as their own members. So with that, I would call on Chairman Jim Sensenbrenner to introduce his governor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is my pleasure and honor today to introduce my friend and constituent, uh, Governor Scott Walker. Uh, I first got acquainted with Scott about 20 years ago when he was starting to get active in Republican politics. Uh, he was elected 17 years ago to the State Assembly, and in 2002 uh, he won a recall election for chief executive or county executive of Milwaukee County. He was reelected to two full terms as a Republican in one of the most Democratic counties in the country. And his political success has been based upon the fact that he tells people where he stands and, once elected, implements them. Uh, he faced some very tough times in Milwaukee County as a result of an outrageous pension scandal that his predecessor uh, was at the heart of. He was able to pass nine county budgets or propose nine county budgets without a tax increase 
and this background allowed him to be elected as the 45th governor of Wisconsin last fall. Uh, very few people here, I think, knew who Scott Walker was until the last two months or so. However, those of us who have known Scott Walker and his commitment to principle were really not surprised at uh, the proposals that he made to close not a $137 million budget deficit, but a $3.6 billion budget deficit through the end of the next budget period. So again, I'm sure that you will find Governor Walker as interesting as we in Wisconsin have. Uh, uh, he's a very polarizing figure, but those of us who love him in Wisconsin really thank him for the job that he's done. I thank the gentleman. And with all the people that uh, Governor Shumlin could have had introduce him, he chose Peter Welsh. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, uh, members of uh, the committee that I proudly serve on. It is my pleasure to introduce Governor Peter Shumlin of Vermont. Uh, first of all, a couple of things uh, about uh, Peter. Uh, he is a private sector person. Uh, he and his brother established uh, and expanded a very successful uh, private business, Putney Student Travel, in southern Vermont. Uh, he has been on the front line of creating jobs, of having to uh, pay uh, good wages uh, and good benefits and deal with the practical realities of keeping a business going day in and day out, expanding it, growing it, and being an employer. Uh, he also served in our citizen legislature in Vermont for many years, first in the House of Representatives. Uh, and then for several terms in the State Senate. And, Peter, as the uh, President pro tem of the State Senate, that is our Senate leader, uh, served more years as Senate President than any other Vermonter in history, uh, and that is 10 years. So he comes to his job with legislative experience, with private sector experience, with the obligation to pay bills and make the trains run on time. He is now serving as Governor of Vermont after being elected uh, this, in this past election. Just to give you a sense of how Vermont operates, uh, he won a primary uh, with f four other Democrats, and there was a recount because his original uh, margin of victory was about 200 votes. During the recount, Peter and the four other candidates rented a van, and while we were awaiting the outcome of who won, went on a unity tour around the State of Vermont talking together rather than fighting each other during the recount. Every single member of five excellent candidates all said, we trust our town clerks and just let them do the count and we will accept the result. He also comes to the job with the benefit of a tremendous history that we in Vermont are proud of, a bipartisan uh, tradition. And it embraces really two things. Number one, we fight hard in Vermont, Republicans and Democrats, just like we do here. But in Vermont, Democrats think that Republicans usually have a merit to their argument, and Republicans think Democrats have something to say. And we actually do our best to listen to each other because both sides have enough humility to appreciate that, in fact, there is truth on both sides and we have got to come together for the good of the State. And just a little bit of background, we had a Governor Snelling, uh, Richard Snelling, very respected and revered. We had a downturn in the 80s. He did something with a Democratic Speaker of the House to try to adjust uh, the fiscal situation, because we pay our bills. We don't, in Vermont, have a balanced budget amendment, but we are cheap and we pay our bills. We are frugal. He, the Democrats agreed to cut programs that were really important to them. The Governor agreed to a temporary surtax because we needed some revenues. It worked out. We came into balance. The taxes went down, and we were able to support our programs. We then had Governor Dean in good times. He cut taxes. He's a, a Democrat, and uh, when he did that, uh, he Im implemented some tough budget reforms to make sure we didn't spend just because we had a surplus. We sent money back to the taxpayer, and we put into place budget controls. Peter Shumlin is carrying on that tradition. Uh, when we got into a fiscal situation, Governor Douglas, his predecessor, Republican, worked with the unions and said, hey, we have got to share the sacrifice here. They negotiated pay cuts. They started looking at benefits. They sat down at the table and worked it out. And there was a sense of common purpose, shared sacrifice. And that is the second approach 
that has been embodied in Vermont, if there is pain that has to be uh, sustained, we have to share that pain together. And what it has done is helped us make progress even in tough times. Peter, just to give you an idea, as Senate President, when we had a large Democratic majority, he did something that uh, you would get kind of a, you would get mentally tested around here if you did it. He appointed Republicans to chair major committees. So in Vermont, the two principles are listen to each other, there is truth on both sides, and work together and share sacrifice when sacrifice is required. So it is my pleasure to introduce Governor Peter Shumlin of Vermont. I thank the gentleman. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in. Would you please rise to uh, take the oath and raise your right hand? Peter, you can stay seated. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. Gentlemen, we have congressmen who come before us, senators who come before us, and governors come before us. Governors are always the best witnesses. They understand that the five minutes allows for the Q&A that, in fact, your entire testimony be placed in the record. Uh, to help you with this, you will see the typical green, yellow, and red lights. As my, uh, my predecessor on the committee said, in all 50 states, we know what red means. So uh, with that, I recognize we didn't do a coin flip. So who wants to go first? Governor Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee, visiting members as well. Uh, Governor, it's good to be with you here as well. We got to know each other a little bit uh, after the elections uh, with the new training for new governors. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. As was mentioned by several in the testimony, you know, we're not alone in Wisconsin. There's 44 different states in the District of Columbia uh, that's facing uh, deficits. In fact, in total, over $111 billion in total deficits, ranging from 2 to 45 percent of their budgets. In our case in Wisconsin, for the next biennial budget, which starts July 1, we face a $3.6 billion budget deficit. Now, governors across the country, Democrat and Republican alike, are facing that challenge. In many cases, Proposals we have seen from one end of the country to the other are governors cutting. In many cases, they are cutting billions of dollars from aid to local governments, school districts, and others. And in turn, what it is forcing in many of those states is one of two things, either massive layoffs or massive property tax increases, and in many cases, sadly, some of both. In Wisconsin, we have a different option, a progressive, in the best sense of the word, a progressive option. For us, we are giving State and local governments the tools they need not just to balance the budget this year or for the next two years, but for generations to come. And that is important. Now, some here and other places around the country may say that is a bold political move, but I would argue it is a very modest request. What we are asking from government employees like myself is a 5.8 percent per contribution for our pension and a 12.6 percent contribution for health care. That is protecting the middle class. That protects middle class jobs and middle class taxpayers. And if you ask middle class workers in my state, they will tell you they think what we are offering is pretty reasonable. I will give you a good example. I don't have to go too far from that. My brother David uh, works as a uh, banquet manager, part time as a bartender. His wife works for a department store. They have two beautiful kids. One just turned four the other day. They are a typical middle class family. When this debate first started, he said to me, you know, I pay some $800 a month for my health insurance premiums and the little bit I can set aside for my 401 I would love to have a deal. I would love to have a deal like what you are offering. I hear that all across my state. When I go to plants and factories and small businesses and farms, they say we would love to have a deal like that because on average our middle class taxpayers are paying about 20 percent of their health insurance premiums. In fact, you all know this with Federal employees. Federal employees pay on average 28 percent of their health insurance premiums. As the Chairman alluded to, Federal employees, for the most part, do not have collective bargaining rights for uh, benefits and, and ultimately for salary. makes me wonder why the protesters are in Madison and Columbia and not right here in Washington, D.C. You've got to look at the facts. I mean, it is very clear out there. Uh, what we are offering is more generous than what you offer Federal government employees, and yet the outrage is not here. It is in our State capitals. More important, though, than just the fiscal impact, because what we are talking about here uh, ultimately saves $1.7 billion in State and local government 
uh, spending over the next two years in our biennial budget. It is not the only way we are balancing our budget, but it is a piece of that. The other important element to remember is this makes government work better. I can think no better example than a young woman by the name of Megan Sampson, who a year ago was named the Outstanding Teacher of the Year, a teacher of the Milwaukee Public School System at the time, and a week later she got a pink slip. She was one of the teachers laid off. Why? Because her collective bargaining agreement required a contract that protected a system that pays more than $100,000 in compensation, total compensation per teacher, with no contribution for health care, and ultimately has a system based on seniority. Our reforms allow schools and other local governments to hire and fire based on performance and merit, paying for performance so we put our best teachers and our best workers out front. That ultimately is going to make things work better. It worked in Indiana when Mitch Daniels did this six years ago. We have seen the government more efficient, more effective, more accountable to the public, and ultimately great workers are rewarded in that state and continue to be rewarded today. Finally, the last thing I would just tell you is this, this ultimately is good for the economy in our state as well, because in the end, investors, Investors want to look at a State where the State and local government is stable. We are showing that Wisconsin is open for business. And the thing I guess the most important point I would bring up to you today is when you think about what we are doing, we are really making a commitment to the future. I have got two high school sons. In fact, some of their classmates are here today from Wauwatosa East High School. Our proposals are about making a commitment to the future so our children, our children don't face even more dire consequences than what we face today. For more than 200 years, this country has been based on leadership, where leaders cared more about their children and their grandchildren than they did about themselves. It is time here in Wisconsin and across this country we have leaders, again, who worry more about the next generation, the next election, and that is exactly what we are doing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Governor. Governor Shumlin. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member. Cummings, thank you so much for this invitation today. To all members of the Oversight and Reform Committee, in particular thanks to my friend and Congressman Peter Welch, who uh, does an extraordinary job for us down here in Washington. Thanks for that warm welcome. Uh, it is great to be here also with Governor Walker. Uh, as, he, as Governor Walker mentioned, uh, we met at Baby Governor School out in Colorado. And I don't want to give you any ideas, any of you Congress people running for Governor, but if you do, you get to go to school. And we had a wonderful dinner together, uh, Governor Walker, myself, and his wonderful wife. And uh, we share common challenges. We are among the biggest class of new governors in the history of America. And we share uh, a very challenging job. In fact, I said to Governor Walker earlier, I said, if they told us it may be Governor School, uh, the message that we were taking over we might have rethought it, but it was too late. But uh, we are dealing with some really tough economic times, as you know. And I, to help make Governor Walker's trip to Washington more uh, valuable, I brought a little bit of Vermont maple syrup down, <laughs> Governor. And uh, I just want to make clear that we are the number one maple producer in the country. Uh, Governor Walker is number four, and our syrup, it doesn't come any better. Governor, how did you get that through TSA? You know, that, that's, that's one of the advantages of being Governor that Governor Walker can tell you about. There is no more TSA, so that is how I brought the syrup down. But uh, thank you. Uh, I, I don't, we are both facing the first 100 days. We have similar challenges, creating jobs and raising incomes of those uh, that are earning less money in Vermont or, on average, the same money as they were earning 10 years ago. That is both of our challenges in our respective States, and the other Governors share it. Now, Mr. Chair, I just want to directly address the question of what, not what's, of what's causing this fiscal crisis that both Governor Walker and I find ourselves are in. We know it is a result of the greatest recession in American history. The result for us is declining revenues and expanding expenses as we face higher unemployment rates, higher service calls and the rest, costs and the rest. That is the challenge. Now, without getting into how we got here, because I know that has been debated and we will save that debate for another day, I simply want to talk a little bit about what our challenge is as Governors to create jobs, economic opportunities and balance our budgets. And when I look at it, I don't start with collective bargaining and I don't start with my public pensions. I start with the true costs. In Vermont, and this is true in most of the States of the country, health care is my biggest rising cost. I have watched health care costs in Vermont double over the last decade, from $2.5 billion to $5 billion a year. In 2015, my Banking Insurance Commissioner tells me Vermonters will be spending an additional $1.6 billion on health care, and that is the biggest cost in my State budget. 
Now, what does that mean in real dollars? It means $2,500 by 2015, that is $1.6 billion, $2,500 out of every Vermonter's pocket, from those that were born yesterday to those at the end or, other end of life, in a State where, on average, our people are making the same wages they were making 10 years ago. So I am going where the money is for both the State and the people of my State to grow jobs and economic, economic opportunities. We are trying to get health care costs under control. The second driver, believe it or not, it is corrections. Our corrections budget has doubled in the last decade. Other governors are facing similar challenges. So we are trying to go where the money is. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about our experience uh, with State pension and retiree health care obligations for State employees, because I think it really matters in this debate. What we have learned in this area is that there are st steps that you can take to signif significantly reduce the cost of taxpayers without undermining traditional defined benefit plans, which most objective parties agree provide better retirement security, serve to retain quality employees, and are more efficient than a defined contribution plan. That is what we have learned. How did we get there and how did we work together to get the job done? What we did, and I was then President of the Senate with a Republican Governor and a Republican Speaker, is we brought the unions together. And we understood that it was going to be an example of shared sacrifice, and so did our State employees, as Congress, Congressman Welch suggested. What did we get? In those discussions, the lesson we learned was that we get more with maple syrup than we do with vinegar. We brought them to the table, we talked it out, and here was the result, shared sacrifice, 3 to 5 percent pay cuts for all State employees, depending upon your range of salary, over a two-year period with no step increases. Two, we got higher retirement contributions from our State employees. Three, uh, we raised retirement ages for State employees to help us with the problem. Four, we reduced health care benefits to our State employees and some of our teachers. And uh, five, uh, we required what this resulted in was a 25 percent reduction in our annual payment to pension funds and still have them fully funded. So the point I am simply trying to make is you can get this job done, you can balance your budget, you can create jobs in your State without taking on the basic right of collective bargaining. Now, I re the reason I feel so strongly about that is I ask the question, who got us into this mess? And how do we deal with it? I can tell you from my perspective as Governor, we just came through the toughest winter in about 20 years. Lots of snow, lots of ice. Our plow trucks were out almost every day. We have eaten through our plowing budgets. I got to tell you, I went out with a plow truck, as I am sure Governor Walker has done. We get out as Governors. And when I got behind the windshield of that plow truck, in a driving snowstorm, with my plow truck driver who was working seven or eight different levers with a 14-foot plow in front of that truck and uh, a tractor-trailer truck passing him on the right and some Yahoo on the left, I got to tell you, in a full whiteout working a 12 or 14-hour day for about 14 bucks an hour, that plow truck driver didn't get us into this mess. When I go and visit schools and I see the children, that, the, the challenges our kids are dealing with, they didn't get us into this mess. My public employees didn't get us here. We have asked them to share the sacrifice in getting us out, but it doesn't mean that we take away collective bargaining, which is what made the middle class in America strong and the folks that are under assault in this recession. So in closing, Mr. Uh, Chair, I will simply say this. We have found, as I mentioned, that you can bring folks together around the table compromise, get the job done, balance your budgets, create jobs, be fiscally responsible, but you don't have to take on the basic principle of collective bargaining. You don't take on your firefighters, you don't take on your police officers, you don't take on your teachers, and you don't take on your hardworking employees. You work together with them with maple syrup, not vinegar. It works. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. I will now recognize myself for the first round of questions. Governor, uh, the sign behind me, uh, we don't normally point to the sign, it is just the title here today, but the last part where it says 
choice or necessity. The cuts you made in cooperation with your various union groups and public workers, because probably like most states, 80 percent of what you spend, you spend directly or indirectly on the people who work for the government. Was it a choice? Was it a necessity to, in fact, find a way to provide essential services for less money and not go into deficit spending? It was a necessity. I mean, in respect that uh, any, while well, we don't have a balanced budget amendment, as Congressman Wells suggested, uh, we have to balance our budgets to get the job done. And so we made the choices that we do in Vermont because we really like Thank our you. AAA bond rating. I am a business person. We want to be fiscally responsible. And we understand that we can't take care of the most vulnerable unless we balance our budgets. Good. And I would like to ask Governor Walker the same question. And we are rather in love with the title of today, so we <laughs> thought we would get that answer out. Well, I, I think in a rhetorical sense it certainly is necessary. But we have seen in the past, in my State's history prior to us making these critical decisions right now, uh, for many it was a choice, and the reason they failed to make the right choice is why we are here today. And that includes Democrats and Republicans before. For many, many years, lawmakers and governors in our State uh, failed to make the right choice, pushed deferred tough decisions to the future. Uh, they raided segregated funds. They delayed payments. They used one-time Federal stimulus aid two years ago to balance their budget. And that is, along with the meltdown of the economy, largely why we and other States, I think, are facing major budget crises. Well, thank you, Governor. And one of the reasons we titled uh, today's hearing that way, knowing you would be here, is I happen to be from California. And we, too, in our State, under Republicans and Democratic governors, have been increasing debt while claiming to have balanced the budget. And you know, I am an old businessman like Governor Shumlin. If, you're, if, you're, if your assets aren't per se going up and your liabilities are going up, you don't claim you are in balance. And that is a problem that I have seen in many States, and particularly my own. Governor Shumlin, you, you mentioned one thing in your opening statement that was very interesting to me. You said a defined benefits plan is more efficient. I would be interested to see what efficiency do you get by having a plan which promises something in the future that no one can be sure of, actuarials try, but obviously they often fail because you see these large adjustments. What is efficient about that versus knowing that an amount of money is going into a fund and that amount of money will be invested fairly and, in fact, will be available as it yields? Which one is more efficient? from a standpoint of predictability. And, I, and I'm not talking about 401ks or individual. I'm saying, uh, for example, uh, unions who, uh, trade unions in my state, if you're an electrical contractor, you can't control a contractor that hires you today versus tomorrow. So you're, you're actually, even though you try to be defined benefits, you're a defined contribution plan because you only get in the year in which you're employed as an electrical contractor from that company that's employing, you only get that much money. And the next year you can't control uh, you can't claw back the way your employees can claw back. So what, why did you say that it was a f uh, efficient, that the efficiency question kind of lost me? Well, it is efficient for two reasons. The first is it gives the employee a guaranteed retirement plan. And I think there has been tremendous misunderstanding of that okay. around, the second, around the country, which is that in Vermont, as an example, our average pension, and that is no, I, no, I understand why yeah. it is more desirable for the recipient. Right. Uh, here in the Federal Government, we have a defined benefits plan. Right. The efficiency, and, the efficiency well, well, from my perspective yes. as Governor is simply that the returns for our investment, uh, not taking a picture of it during the worst recession, but over time, and unlike General Motors or, you know, you don't go bankrupt, States don't go bankrupt, they never have, and I believe bankruptcy has been greatly exaggerated. Well, it is not within the Constitution that Thank you. gives you a choice. There, therefore, we are held to a slightly different standard than a General Motors retirement plan. The point right. being, the average return for us has been around 8.5 8 percent, and okay. it gives us the ability to efficiently deliver a predictable defined benefit for an employee who is often working for less than you would get paid for their lifetime. Okay. I think I have got your answer. I would like to get Governor Walker. Along that line, why is that more efficient than knowing the amount that you give in a given year under the budget is the amount? And even if you invest it and you try to make the same returns, ultimately the State knows that the next year they are going to give a similar percentage. Why is, uh, and, and like I say, the Federal Government has defined benefits, but why is that more efficient versus perhaps making sure that you budget without these ups and downs that come when the yield doesn't occur? 
Well, I think when you look at benefits, be they in the public or the private sector, defined contribution is ultimately more efficient. Uh, that is not what I am advocating. In our case, just like you mentioned with the Federal Government, just like Vermont, uh, we have a defined uh, uh, benefit as well, particularly for retirement with the pension. Although I think it is important to know what we are asking for is not changing the benefit itself. We are asking for people, again, myself included, to pay more as a contribution for the cost of that. Mr. Quigley talked about, Representative Quigley talked about in his opening statements about the State of Illinois. I think that is an important distinction. In Illinois, earlier this year, Governor Quinn and the Legislature raised taxes on individuals and on businesses in an attempt, a supposed attempt to balance their budget. Yet today, they have a pension system that is half funded. We went the opposite way. We lower the tax burden on job creators. We made it easier to do business in the State. We show that Wisconsin is open for business. And we have a pension, <coughs> excuse me, a pension system that is essentially fully funded. That is important because you get to the heart of this. That is why Illinois is in that category of California and others, because they have failed to make the tough decisions to get their finances under control. And that is going to affect their economy. Thank you, Governor. And as I rec recognize the ranking member, I just want to make one thing clear for the record. The Federal Government currently for regular Federal workers, 28 percent of what goes into our health care benefits are paid for by the Federal worker. In the case of the Post Office, it has historically been 20 percent, but one of the major unions has renegotiated it to 25 percent. That is what is happening here centrally in Washington. I recognize the Ranking Member. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The, um, you know, the thing that I think stands out here is the fact that, and I say this to both governors, that sometimes we may lose sight of, and that is that just like the postal workers, we had them before us a few uh, days ago, they were able to shed 100,000 employees out of 700,000 in three years. And one of the things that they said is that they are Americans too, and they don't mind sacrificing. And speaking of sacrificing, um, Governor Walker, when I listened uh, to your testimony, you made it sound as if you have made uh, very reasonable offers to the unions, but that they have been unreasonable by rejecting your offers. For example, you uh, asked employees to contribute 5.8 percent for pension and 12.6 percent for health insurance premiums. And you went on to say that most workers outside of government would love our proposal. You talked about your brother. And like many other workers in our State, he would love a deal like the one I offered to government workers. The thing that I did not hear, though, was that, um, that the unions agreed to double their share of the health insurance premiums and to increase their contributions to the pension system. That is not true? Um, well, what did they do? They, they didn't, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I want to hear what you have to say, because sure, I'm, I'm sure. reading an article from your local paper, and yeah. I'm just wondering what. I uh, will answer the question, sure. uh, Representative. The, uh, two of the statewide union leaders made a statement uh, a week into the debate about suggesting that they, uh, they thought they could accept that. In the weeks that followed, up until the bill was signed into law, nearly every local union that settled a contract settled it without a pension or a health care contribution. To me, actions speak louder than words. Those two statewide leaders could not speak for the unions in nearly 1,000 municipalities, uh, 424 school districts in 72 counties. They are the ones who decide at the local level. And up until the bill was signed into law, they were not following the actions of their leaders. To me, actions spoke louder than words. The other key difference here is we got into this trouble, and I acknowledge both parties in our state, Republicans and Democrats, drove us into this by failing to make tough decisions. If we have a short-term fix, we just push the problem off to the future. What we give are permanent, long-term solutions, the tools that State and local governments need. They can only get it if you make those sorts of changes. And in terms of workplace protections, Wisconsin has the strongest civil service protections in the country. That was passed more than a century ago. Those remain even with this new law in place. That protects uh, grievances, that protects civil service protections in both hiring and firing decisions. All those protections remain even after these changes, Mr. Mr. Well, uh, Cummings. I am looking at an article from the Wisconsin Journal Sentinel, and I guess that is a local paper. Mm -hmm. One of them. And um, th in this article, Democrat State Senator John Erpenbach makes crystal clear that all the State and local public employees, including teachers, have agreed to the financial aspects of your proposal. 
and all they were asking for is that you strip them, that you not strip them of their collective bargaining rights. That is not accurate? Again, that was the statement made by the statewide leaders. The actions they took after those statements, though, contradict those statements. They did not, uh, if they agreed to the 5 and the 12, you would have seen in Janesville and La Crosse and all the other communities that settled contracts, that they would have put their money where their mouth is and actually did that. They did not happen until after the bill was signed into law. So I, I think you are right about the story. It accurately explains what was proposed at the time, but in terms of what they actually did, uh, their actions did not represent or their, their actions did not coincide with the statements of their statewide union leaders. Did you ever consider uh, dropping uh, your collective bargaining demands? Did you ever consider that? For us, to me, having been, I was a county elected official for eight years. Uh, we talk about shared sacrifice because my county faced a crisis. I gave over those eight years $370,000 of my personal salary back. I made a personal sacrifice, just like I am going to pay for more for pension and more for health care as Governor of the State of Wisconsin. During that time, I repeatedly met with my unions and asked them to make modest changes, modest changes in pension and health care contributions. In fact, one year I even asked them to consider a couple of 35-hour work weeks in order to avoid massive layoffs, and every time. The response I got from AFSCME was, go ahead, lay four or 500 people off, we don't care. To me, that is why when I talk about protecting the middle class, I am not just talking about middle class taxpayers outside of government. Those middle class workers that would have been laid off are people I represent as well, just like I do in the State of Wisconsin. If I have to choose between massive layoffs uh, or, or making these sorts of reforms, I would much rather stand on the side of protecting those middle class jobs and protecting middle class taxpayers, because remember, the vast majority of people in the middle class in my State and across the country have been paying the bill for the expanse of government year after year after year, and to me, those are the people I am standing up to protect. And you will never, never hear me speak an ill word throughout this entire debate, no matter, no matter what others may say out there. I have never said an ill word of any of the decent public servants who work, the 300,000 decent people in my State who work for both State and local government. I have great respect for them. I just know that in this together, we have got to make changes to make sure their jobs are protected into the future. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. The Chair now recognizes the Chairman of the Subcommittee, Mr. McHenry, for his round of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, Governor Walker, I certainly appreciate your testimony. Go Governor Shumlin, thank you so much as well. Um, there is this discussion of tough choices. Now, when we are looking at what the government does, right, there are services that municipalities and states um, render to their people as a matter of collection of their tax revenue, whether it is um, local governments providing police and, and, um, and uh, protection uh, through uh, uh, the police or uh, making sure that uh, if somebody's house is on fire, you have a fireman show up. So there are tough choices between the services that the government provides and uh, the obligations it has. So, Governor Walker, can you discuss this, this challenge for a governor who walks into a very tough budget situation? The, the, the challenge between do you continue to provide these services people expect, taxpayers expect, or do you continue providing a benefit for a select few? Uh, meaning, you know, you have a pension obligation, you have health care benefits and these types of things. The, the, the people that are getting the benefit are largely not paying to receive. And then you have the taxpayers who are footing the bill for them. Uh, can, can you discuss that challenge? Sure. Uh, again, I will tell you, not only as a governor for the last couple months, but as a county official for eight years prior to that, uh, for us, we saw the distinction. We saw the challenge when under the, the environment before we passed this bill into law. Uh, for local governments in particular, we were forced with the sacrifice like I faced or the, the, the problem we faced where we, when we had a tough budget time. And we had it long before 2008 because of the pension scandal I inherited back in 2002. So we, we were dealing this ahead of the curve even before the economic meltdown. When we tried to make, as I mentioned before, some, I think some very reasonable changes when it came to what us as government employees paid for things like pension and health care or even some other adjustments temporarily as part of the work week. We did that for two reasons. One, to try and protect as many jobs as possible. And two, in turn, because those jobs provide services, to try and provide, protect core services for the people we serve. 
That is essentially the impetus for me. When I looked at the budget crisis we were facing going into the next two-year cycle of $3.6 billion, I knew we had to make a fundamental change if we weren't going to go down the path that many other governors across the country are, Democrat and Republican alike, where they are cutting billions of dollars from schools, from university systems, from local governments and other areas that affect all the things you mentioned. And instead they are saying, okay, there are the cuts. Now you either make it up through massive layoffs or you make it up through massive property tax increases. I said in my state, I can't afford to have anybody, be they in the public or the private sector, any more massive layoffs. I need more people working. We are changing the business climate. We are showing, in fact, many of the issues, Republican and Democrats alike, we brought together uh, to pass legislation that made us one of the most proactive pro-job agendas in the country. We had to do all that. We want to protect jobs. By the same token, we know one of the other things that would cut down that recovery would be a massive tax increase. We saw it two years ago when my predecessor raised taxes on corporations and on individuals. We saw the jobs leave. We saw the exodus. We want those people to come back. And I understand competitiveness, especially in the Midwest, in terms of job creation. And so there is competition on tax rates, obviously, right? Absolutely. We love the fact uh, that while our corporate tax rate is 7.9 percent, the effective tax rate in Illinois is now 9.5 percent. Well, uh, we love that distinction because we want more people to come up to Wisconsin. Well, thank you. And um, the, the other question I have is, so, you, you know, as opposed to a private sector pension, where those that are receiving the pension benefit are the ones that are affected by the changes, they are the only ones really affected. Um, the difference with that in public sector pensions is that we as taxpayers have to foot that bill. Mm -hmm. So it is not simply a, a lie perpetrated to the beneficiary of a re, uh, or the recipient of the pension. Uh, saying perhaps too rosy a scenario on return on investment or underfunding these pensions, and so on and so forth. It is also a lie to those taxpayers that have to foot the bill for those uh, underfunded pensions or less than funded pensions. So my question to you, Governor Walker, is do you believe that there is sufficient transparency and disclosure with public sector pensions today? Well, I think at both the State and the local level as well, there needs to be more transparency. One of the things we are the most proud about this budget is not only that we balanced the $3.6 billion deficit, but the fact that two years ago we had the largest structural deficit in State history. In my budget I presented at the beginning of March to the State Legislature, we reduced the structural deficit by more than $2 billion, a 90 percent reduction. It is where Moody's pointed out that they called it credit positive. When is the last time you heard anything called credit positive related to a government budget? They call it credit positive because we finally took control of what we should have been doing for years and, and, and weren't from both political parties. That is incredibly positive. But the more people know about it, right now, you know, actuaries and a lot of others pay attention to, to pensions and retirement systems. All of us should be because that is just deferring, in many cases, it has been about deferring the problem to the next generation. We can't do that anymore. Thank you. And, uh, and I know my time has expired, but certainly those that are arguing now about public sector pensions. You have those that are saying that the, these pensions are underfunded and it is bad. Those are the optimists. Those that look at the pension system and say this is a calamity are the other side of the, the coin. No one is saying that public sector pensions are too well funded or even sufficiently funded. So well, thank you for your. And the one thing important to remember, I, I mentioned the Illinois Wisconsin distinction. Not only are they half funded, but you have the Speaker of the General Assembly, a Democrat, a longtime union ally spoke a month ago about the possibility of reducing the pension benefit itself. That is what happens when you don't take these issues seriously. That is not a Republican or Democrat issue. This is someone who has been a stalwart defender of unions, is now talking about in Illinois the prospect of reducing the benefit. That to me would be unacceptable. We made a promise to our public servants about what the retirement benefits were going to be. We should protect that no matter what party we are in. We just got to fix it in the way in. Thank you, Governor. We now recognize the former chairman of the full committee, Mr. Towns, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Governor Walker, why do people in general, you know, I have talked to people from your state, people just around the nation, feel that your focus is on helping the corporations and basically the wealthy at the expense of the middle class and the poor. Why would they have that perception of you? Well, it would be erroneous. Uh, maybe it is because they are watching some of the TV ads that groups from Washington played in the State of Wisconsin. Because what we have done in the first month, first two months almost, 
Democrats voted for many of the measures we pushed through that, that create a better business environment in our State. Um, even the tax cuts we put in place were things like removing the State tax on health savings accounts, which isn't about corporations. It is about small businesses. It is about family farmers. It is about sole proprietorships. Uh, the incentives we put in for job creation were targeted specifically for jobs. So it is ultimately about the workers when, when a job is created and there is an incentive to do that. The other things we did in our legislative package were all things that were about making it easier to do business in the State of Wisconsin. And in our budget, the things that we are doing are about protecting jobs when, and protecting the middle it, class. When you say make it easy, what do you mean by that, giving tax breaks to the big business? No, we don't give tax breaks to the big business. What we do is something that is targeted for small businesses and big alike. We have a specific job tax credit, and if you create a job, there is a tax incentive in there, but it is tied specifically to job creation. So the, the person who benefits the most is the recipient of that job. Uh, if there is not a job there, they don't get a tax break. Right. What is the employment rate in Wisconsin? Uh, we have a 7.4 percent unemployment rate, still too high, obviously less than the national average. First two months of this year, we have had about 13,000 jobs created in the private sector, about 8,200 new jobs in manufacturing. And next week, we will put out our new job numbers, and I think we are going to be well on the right path. Did you have to lay off workers and, and municipal workers or government employees in order to uh, put your budget in place and to get the 13,000 that was increased? I mean, what do you, I mean, I'm trying to get the real balance. Yeah, no, no, you're right. Because in our case, in, in, in putting this budget together, we actually avoided it. For the remainder of fiscal year 11, uh, the deficit for the fiscal of the budget put together by my predecessor, Jim Doyle, uh, we had to make up uh, about $137 million. We knew to set the stage for the $3.6 billion deficit we had to balance for the next two-year budget, we had to do a series of things. We made some other changes, some other reforms. So what we are talking about here today was one part of it. It saves about $1.7 billion over the next two years for both State and local government. But for State government, uh, the impact uh, through the final couple months through June 30th, which is the end of our fiscal year, was a $30 million savings. By getting that savings, we avoid having to lay off approximately 1,500 State workers. So we avoided layoffs that way. you ever think about using maple syrup? <laughs> well, I've got some now. It's pretty good. Yeah. It's not as good as the cranberry juice we make in Wisconsin, but it's yeah. pretty good, right? Rather than using the vinegar. <laughs> well, I've tried. As a, as a county executive, I tried for eight years, uh, and the unions basically told me they're layoff people. And to me, that's just unacceptable. If you're truly for the workers, to me, my, in this economy, the last thing I want to do is see people laid off. And and this was a much much better approach. Governor Schumer, how did you get? Um, uh, people to have a different attitude. I, I, I just don't quite understand why people in Wisconsin, uh, you know, uh, would think that way. I mean, when uh, you know, Wisconsin uh, uh, is just like a lot of other states in this nation. You know, Governor. You know, so but anyway, Governor Schumer. Well, uh, thank you, Congressman Towns. And you know, I, I'm sitting here listening to Governor Walker, and I'm sitting here realizing we all have similar challenges as governors. Uh, unlike Congress, we've all got to balance our budgets. So the real question is, what are we arguing about? And my point is, if you want to go after collective bargaining, which I believe helped build this country, helped build the middle class that has been under assault in this recession, you know, just come out and say it, I am going to go after collective bargaining. But if you want to balance your budget, you bring people in, you talk to them, you have a dialogue. I can guarantee you this, what Vermonters are looking for and what they expect is the same thing that they expect in Wisconsin and the same thing they wish for and expect in America. They want reasonableness. They want compromise. They want bright people working together to solve problems. And when you use vinegar, when you refuse to meet with unions, when you don't sit down and talk with them, when you take on an out outright assault on a basic principle in a democratic society, which is collective bargaining, the thing that my grandfather, when he got off the boat, and others now rely on and relied on to make a decent living, to come from a beet farmer to success in America, the thing that built our country, well, that is a different debate. So I think really what we are talking about, because I sit and listen to Governor Walker talk about how he is approaching his challenges, all we governors are doing the same things here, folks. The question is, are you going to bring people together to solve problems, or are you going to go after an assault on a basic principle in America, which is collective bargaining? I think we are trying, trying to do two different things. If you want to go after collective bargaining, just come out and say it, hey, we are taking you on. But don't try and blame the worst recession in American history on the need to go after public pensions. I am listening to the question over here. You know, let's be honest about this. Taxpayers have always paid for a part of public pension. 
retirement plans. This isn't something new, folks. This started with pensions, with asking public employees to give up economic opportunities that they might have if they did what I did and went into the public sector and built a business and made a lot of money. In exchange for getting a lower wage, in exchange for less economic opportunity, they get a guaranteed $25,000, $22,000 on average retirement once they are all done. Now, it is not new news that taxpayers pay a portion of that and that employees pay the other portion. What is new is that in my State, in Governor Walker's State, we are asking the employees to pay more than they did before. Right. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, let me just say this, uh, Mr. Chairman, in, in closing. Uh, uh, Governor, keep using maple syrup. We are going to try. Thank you. The gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Governor Shumlin, I would like to talk to you, if I could, about uh, your, the pension plan uh, in, in your State. And I come from Utah. We have, I think, two things that are, have uh, served us well. One is, we, in our State Constitution, we have a balanced budget amendment. That has forced the issue to actually balance budgets. Number two, we have a defined contribution plan as opposed to a defined benefit plan. And consequently, our State has one of the lowest tax rates. Its business is, is thriving. Um, and we have hundreds of millions of dollars in our rainy day fund. Now, I went back and looked at the Pew study on Vermont. And you are actually doing better than most States, but funded at about 92 percent. Um, but explain to me, you, you had made a comment to, to the Chairman here about the predictability of, of the pension program. And I want to talk about the health of that program, because I can't imagine that a defined contribution plan is not superior than to a, a defined benefit plan, because how do, you, how do you account for that? Well, I, all I can tell you is that it served my and other States well that have used defined benefit plans, and that we have ha had over time But the health over the course of time, I mean, if somebody told me they right. thought they were going to get an 8, and a, eight to 8.5 eight percent return, I would say they are probably smoking those maple leaves. It, I it, can't it, imagine that you are getting 8 to 8.5 eight percent re return on that investment. Nobody is getting that kind of return right now. Uh, if you look at the averages for State pensions across the history of defined benefit plans, you will find that we get about an 8 percent return on average. And obviously, there are good years and bad years. But unlike General Motors, since we are not going bankrupt, bankrupt you have got to look at the averages. And that is what we have gotten. That is why Wall Street, when you but go do down you think you are going to get that going forward? May I just finish, Congressman? Yeah, but going what, forward, do you think you are going to get that? We do. And that is why Moody's and the other bonding agencies allow us to assume that rate of return on our investments. So we are not sort of making this up as governors. That is what Wall Street requires us to do. It is based on history. The second point that I think is really important, if you are a governor, you have to deal with the real world. And the real world is, if you were to move from a defined benefit to a defined contribution plan, hypothetically, it would cost you a ton of money in the first 10 to 15 years, for the reason that the current employees help to support the pension obligations of the States in a defined benefit plan. If you pull the new ones out, you immediately have a higher upfront cost than you would otherwise, because you have got to support your existing defined benefit as you move to a defined contribution. So there are a lot of reasons why we governors are not thrilled at the idea. And you are hearing this from Republicans and Democrats, this notion that, you know, if you just move to a defined contribution, all our problems are going to be solved, isn't in the real world for us governors. Would the gentleman yield very quickly? Yes. Governor, if you are fully funded, that is not true. If you are fully funded, you would be able to stop putting money in the moment you make the switch, because if you are fully funded, your 8.5 percent would pay out all your benefits. So you can't have it both ways. We are adequately funded. Well, okay. As long as we understand it, adequately is kicking the can down the road. Uh, so the studies show that if you only got the rate of return of the Treasury, you would run out in 2023 with the current situation. You would depend on a high return that you cannot bank on in your own statement. I yield well, back. If I can just finish, if I can answer that, Mr. Chair. It is uh, a gentleman, sure, it's a gentleman go time. Go ahead. Go ahead, go. go ahead. If I can answer that. Uh, we don't make this stuff up as governors. Both Governor Walker and I uh, traveled down to Wall Street to try to convince them that we are running sound economic states, that our bond rating depends on our economic future. We manage our retirement funds based upon the expectations of Wall Street. Now, Vermont is obviously doing that right since we have a AAA bond rating. One reason is that we use the actuarial projections that Wall Street gives us, which are higher than a Treasury return. 
And I am just telling you that if you really study this issue, you will find that Vermont is not doing anything radical here. We are doing what Wall Street expects us to do, and it is a higher return than you would, the yield you would get on a Treasury yield, much higher. Governor, Chairman, as I, I conclude here, I don't want to go over my time. I really do think that a flashing red light for uh, investors, for this country, for the Congress, because we fully anticipate that States will try to be running back to the Congress to get we, we can't even fund ourselves. We can't even manage our books here. I don't want the States to ever think they are coming to the Federal Government to get a bailout. I think States that, do, that have not made that difficult choice and made the difficult transition to a defined contribution plan are putting themselves in peril and in great risk. That is our experience in Utah. We made that difficult choice. It is on a more sound trajectory, and I think you will find that States who did make that, make that effort and make that transition will be much more sound financially. That is my perspective of it, but I think it is going to be one of the big issues moving forward, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the former mayor of Cleveland, Ohio, Dennis Kucinich, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Governor Walker, you said the union leaders agreed to the financial cuts, but then you blamed the local unions for not following through on these pledges. Uh, that is because you refused to drop your demand to strip workers of collective bargaining rights that had nothing to do with the budget, and uh, refused to negotiate and rejected the union's offer. Now, Governor Walker, if the unions in Wisconsin agreed to the financial cuts you sought, I don't understand how this can continue to be characterized as a debate about State budget deficits. This is supposed to be a hearing about State municipal debt. I don't understand how repealing collective bargaining rights for public workers shows us anything about State debt. Let me ask you about some of the specific provisions in your proposal to strip collective bargaining rights. First, your proposal would require unions to hold annual votes to continue representing their own members. Can you please explain to me and members of this committee how much money this provision saves for your State budget? That and a number of other provisions we put in, because if you are going to ask, if you are going to put in place a change like that, uh, we wanted to make sure that we protected the workers of our State so that they had a right to know what kind of value they got on it. It is the same reason we gave workers the right to choose, which is a fundamental American right, the right to choose whether or not they want to be a part of a union and Would whether or not the they question, went up to $1,000 taking How much other money unions. does it save, Governor? Just that answer that the That particular part doesn't save any. Okay. In, that's the, same, right. in the same way that that's if you, the point. If you read the Federal budget, no effect I'll, I'll answer your I'm question. I am reclaiming my time. It obviously had no effect whatsoever on the State budget. I want to ask about another one of your proposals. Under your plan, you would prohibit employees from paying union member dues from their paychecks. How much money would this provision save your State budget? It would save employees up to $1,000 per year they could use to pay for their pension and their health care contributions. Governor, uh, it wouldn't save anything. There are minor administrative costs, if any. It is obvious what the real intent is here. It is to I'll give workers it a right. It is to give the workers the right to choose. I will back it up. Mr. Uh, Chairman, right here from the State of Wisconsin's Legislative Fiscal Bureau, this is a nonpartisan State budget agency, much like the Congressional Budget Office. The Bureau was asked to identify provisions in the Governor's uh, bill uh, that are non-fiscal, non-fiscal policy items that have no State fiscal effect. This letter confirms the obvious, that Governor Walker's effort to repeal the rights of State workers is a non-fiscal, non-fiscal policy item, no effect on the State budget shortfall. I ask unanimous consent that this letter be included in the record. Reserving the right, we will inspect it and plan to include it in the record. That is unusual. You would reserve the right to object. Uh, the gentleman, the gentleman will time. suspend. Uh, Hold the time. We, we fully expect to include it in the record. Because it is not a publication that is widely distributed, we simply would like to receive it. And as soon as it has been uh, quickly vetted during this hearing, it will be accepted. Uh, that is a consistent policy from both sides. I would like if to respond. In yes, the 14 sir. years that I have been on this committee, I have never had a chairman reserve the right uh, to object to putting an official document in the record that was central to the, to the purpose of this hearing, determining whether or not you stripping collective bargaining rights, Governor, is a financial is issue or not. It is not. It is a political issue. That is what I am proving. Yeah, gentlemen, the gentleman is incorrect. Chairman Waxman did it repeatedly. In most cases, just as here, by the end of the hearing, items which were not part of widely distributed uh, 
documents were accepted. I expect to do the same, and I would work with the gentleman to get it done before the end of the hearing. Uh, the gentleman may continue. Well, I have just made it a matter of public record anyway. Uh, the, title, the title of this hearing is Choice or Necessity. I think that what we have been able to demonstrate here is that the attack on collective bargaining right, uh, rights is a choice, not a budget issue. Uh, there are budget issues as well that need to be addressed in, in Wisconsin. Uh, for example, uh, according to the National Nurses United and U.S. States facing a budget shortfall, revenues from corporate taxes have declined $2.5 billion in the last year. In Wisconsin, two-thirds of corporations pay no taxes, and the share of State revenue from corporate taxes has fallen by half since 1981. Uh, that is published in The Nation by John Nickel. I won't ask to uh, submit it by unanimous consent. And also, um, in the Real News Network, they have a report here that points out that the short budget, uh, the budget shortfall of $137 million in Wisconsin uh, could have been covered if the State had just kept going its uh, State legislated estate taxes, which they let expire uh, after uh, 2008. Uh, also points out that if they had gone on to collect the estate taxes from their wealthiest citizens, they could have paid down the debt. Now, I just want to say in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, that, that we really are here at the center of a great debate over the purpose of government, whether there is such a thing as a public sphere with public servants who perform duties on behalf of the public using resources that belong to the public. Or is government going to be auctioned off to the highest bidder, to corporations who, who privatize and inevitably drive up the cost of government, drive up the cost of services, drive up taxes? That is where this debate is headed nationally. I think that uh, Governor Walker has inadvertently uh, done a public service by exposing the extent to which this mindset of privatizing what is the public sphere, bringing this issue to the forefront. So thank you for being here, both governors. I guess that is a thank you. Uh, the Chair now recognizes thank the you, gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lankford, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both governors for taking away your time to be able to be here uh, with us. Uh, Governor Shumlin, I want to be able to do a point of clarification. You began your oral statement uh, talking about how you didn't want to balance the budget based on the backs of those great employees, and I, I do concur. We have some terrific Federal employees as well. Uh, but the employees as well by dealing with benefits and you want to go after the real crucial issues. But then you ended your statement by saying, but in the previous Governor's time, they did deal with payment, pensions, retirements, all those things. So while you are not starting your time, you did say, but we have just dealt with that a few months ago. Is that correct? Uh, it has been an ongoing effort. Both the previous Governor, the Republican Governor, don't forget I was President of the Senate. Correct. So I actually helped negotiate the uh, the with his speaker, uh, the agreement with the teachers' union. Right. I was just trying to provide uh, some clarification because you were talking about you didn't want to do that on the backs of workers at this point. Oh. You didn't see you saw corrections right. and you saw health care as a major issue, but you just dealt with some of the retirement issues and such I, recently I as well. I don't mean to suggest that we did not ask our State employees to make sacrifice. We did and they did. Right. Correct. But I'm, all I am suggesting is that we did it by bringing them to the table. Sure. Reasonable okay. So it's just, it's just the method on that side Absolutely. and the, in the cooperation that the others had with all the leadership as well. Obviously, it takes two to tango Absolutely. on that one as well as people to be able to come together. Let me ask you a quick question. Line. Do you think the Federal Government should be involved in bailing out States when they have debt issues? Is there a point in time that you say this State is so far in debt and so far out of balance the Federal Government should step in and bail them out? That is a question I am going to leave to you. That is why I never want to run for Congress. Actually, that is a question I am asking you because as a Governor you obviously represent the, the intents of a State. I will answer it this way. I don't think you are going to have to. And I think that the case for the bankruptcy of States is greatly exaggerated for political reasons. When I go to Wall Street and I say, hey, as I did a few weeks ago, we are pretty, in pretty good shape in Vermont, Wisconsin is in pretty good shape, tell us about some of the States we are really worried about, California, New York, Illinois, and others. And they say, this is Wall Street speaking, the rating agencies, we think that the case is being exploited for political reasons, that there are not States that need to go bankrupt. Right. That we are going to see our way through this and that the, that the case for pension crisis is being overstated by Washington. Okay. Let me ask the same question, Governor Walker. Do you think the Federal Government should bail out individual States? No. 
let me, let me ask a follow-up question with that to both of you as well as we have time, and, and that is, are there things we are doing as a Federal Government that drives up your costs as a State? What I am looking for and what my committee has been dealing a lot with are unfunded mandates, things to say, I would like to get my budget under control, these things I can manage, these things I cannot because the Federal Government has these set of requirements. Are there things we are doing to cause you more debt and more problems in spending? I see we have got two minutes. There is no way I can answer that question in I'll, two minutes. I'll, but I'll, uh, <laughs> I will allow your staff to submit all you can for the record on that. Uh, yeah. Number one thing you could give us, block grant Medicaid. Okay. You give us a block grant for Medicaid, that is, I had to put $1.2 billion more of general purpose revenue, that is State aid, uh, State funding, into this uh, next budget, even though I had to cut everywhere else. It is the biggest part of my budget growing. It is the biggest challenge out there. We have maintenance of efforts that require us to maintain things by the Federal Government when we have other things that would work better to manage those costs. We need to get to a point, and we have led the country. Places like Gunnarsson Lutheran have been ahead of the curve when it comes to the idea and concept of medical homes, paying for performance, paying for outcome, not paying for procedure. Right. Uh, if we had that option, uh, I think any of us, I think Democrat and Republican now, now would like to have that flexibility. Now, you are aware that when I am also on the Budget Committee, when we brought up that idea, we have been told that the Governors will certainly kick people out of nursing homes and they will be ruthless to their populations, then you can't be trusted with any of these funds. Well, that, that argument was made uh, back in the 90s when my good friend Tommy Thompson was Governor and he pushed welfare reform. Uh, Bill Clinton ultimately embraced that welfare reform, and in the end, states were given block grants. All those same sorts of charges were made back then, and instead, uh, we had some of the most successful welfare reform that, during that generation. We can do the same thing now. Governor Shulman, are there areas that we are doing as a Federal Government that is causing you pain as far as on the financial side? Yes. Uh, and uh, just in terms of Governor uh, Walker's response, we are all concerned about health care costs, Medicaid, mm -hmm. Medicare. Uh, the only thing I would caveat with is just a block grant makes me nervous, because as our populations grow older, which is happening in all of our States, as costs and utilization goes up, I don't want it to be an excuse for the Federal Government to get out of its obligation on sharing costs and saying, hey, we are giving you a block grant, you are on your own. If utilization goes up, it is your problem. So how that Correct. flexibility gets translated is really important to us. The details matter. Uh, second, uh, the biggest, another big driver for us is education costs and no child left behind. And there is no question that those mandates are driving education expenses in our public schools, requiring us to teach to a test and requiring extraordinary paperwork of teachers when they could be teaching. Okay. Thank you very much. And with that, I yield back. Oops. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Braley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Bruce Braley, and I am proud to be a public employee. In fact, Governor Walker, when you were a six-year-old growing up in my district in Plainfield, Iowa, I got my first job as a public employee with the Powsheet County Conservation Board. And I learned how to clean toilets, and I learned how to mop floors and scrape gum off the bottom of school desks. And I also worked out in the blazing sun, building bridges on farm-to-market roads, driving an ax into spikes into creosote-treated lumber. And one day on the job, my right hand or my left hand caught on fire. So I know a little bit about what public employees do. And you mentioned the TV ads that groups from Washington ran against you, and yet you yourself had a large amount of support from secret donor groups like the ones that attacked me in my campaign. Are you willing to go on the record here today and denounce the influence of outside secret money in political campaign ads? And I thought the purpose of today was to talk about debt. And, well, and let's talk about, about that. You ran uh, campaign ads on the, on the principle of good government, and I thought that's what we were here to talk about today. Mm -hmm. In fact, you ran a campaign ad called Real Leadership. And, you, and when the campaign ad ran, it says your focus was bringing people together to solve problems. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that ad? Yep. And, and, and I would, and I I would argue if you want me to you ask it, me a question, it, I'll say I remember it. And that's exactly what okay, I did you've answered in the my question. first month and a half when Democrats and Republicans came together to well, push economic excuse development. Excuse me, this is my time, Governor. Well, you, you asked answered me a question. my question. I asked if, you if you want to do a political it. stunt, go I ahead. Think if, I'm not doing a political stunt. I think if Dr. Phil were here, he'd say, how's that working for you? You also ran an ad called Yes, We Can. And you said, working together, we can put government back on the side of the people again. You also ran an ad called Make It Right, talking about government scandal benefiting politicians. You ran all those campaign ads. Well, this is your chance to make it right. Are you ready to apologize to the people of Wisconsin 
for hiring the 27-year-old son of one of your major campaign donors who is a lobbyist, and that individual had no college education, very little managerial experience, and had two drunk driving convictions and was hired for an $81,000 a year job when you obviously had better qualified applicants. Are you ready to make an apology today to the people of Wisconsin? That doesn't sound like good government to me. The, the, chair, the, the chair will ask the gentleman to suspend. Please turn off the clock. The chair would remind all participants, although members here at the dais have a right to speak for five minutes and say anything they want, and we will consider it germane, our witnesses are only asked to respond to items which they came here prepared to respond to that are consistent with the subject of the hearing. So it is for the witnesses to decide whether a question is germane. Well, in fact, the members here have an almost unlimited right to say what they want to say during their five minutes. The gentleman may continue. The, uh, you know, when I grew up in Plainfield, at least for the years I lived there, and Chuck Grassley was our State Assemblyman back then, there were good, decent people, many of whom were farmers, who recognized, many of whom were deacons at my father's church, who recognized when times were tough, you had to make tough decisions, particularly when times were tough in the finances of the church. And that is exactly what we are doing. We are talking about that. You may not want to talk about that. You may want to talk about anything. And I will answer your question about the 27-year-old. I would be, was, answer, I'd be interested in your answer, because that is the he, question that again, people of Wisconsin want to hear today. Well, I am glad you are interested in the people of Wisconsin. I am. Because that person was five levels below me. When that position, was, when that uh, hiring was brought to my attention, I had my staff go back and have that person taken out of that position, and I acknowledged the fact that there were more qualified people, and I asked someone else to be put into that. So that is the answer to your question. Well, in fact, that, the, 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 well, if you look at, again, I am reclaiming my time. Well, if you the Milwaukee hear, you Journal, don't the truth, Mr. Chairman, keep it up. Has, in, has written an article about this and noted that two of the highly quali qualified candidates for that administrative post were Oscar Herrera, a former State Cabinet Secretary under Republican Governor Scott McCollum, who had a doctoral degree and eight years of experience overseeing the cleanup of petroleum-contaminated sites. The second, Bernice Madison, was a professional engineer who served since 2003 in the post to which Mr. DeShane was appointed and had 25 years of experience in State government. And since the whole focus of this hearing is on good government practices and how that affects the debt that States have, I think it is time that we got some straight answers from the people who are radically reforming State governments, and that is why this is so important. And I would ask the chairman to hold a hearing, and I have got a letter for the, for the chairman, since we have broad jurisdiction, according to the committee's website, to look into the other factors that are impacting State budgets, including cronyism in State government. And I have got a letter to the chairman to that effect. I ask unanimous consent uh, for the article from the Dubuque Telegraph Herald titled, Walker Insults Young Worker with Cronyism, published on April 11 of 2011 to be made a part of the record, and I yield back. Without objection, the gentleman yields back. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, Governors, thank you both for being here. This is very insightful for me, especially in my home state of Florida, where we are also going through some of the similar uh, exercises that you all have gone through. Uh, it is interesting because uh, when we look back at the history of collective bargaining, especially with public sector unions, it was Franklin Delano Roosevelt and both President John F. Kennedy who did not feel that there should be collective bargaining or there should be public sector unions. So being here today on this issue I think shows the evolution of this and, and why it is such a crucial issue, especially in light of the, uh, the, the, the debt and deficits that each State in this country is facing. The, the Federal Government in the Office of Personnel Management has published uh, consecutively for years up until 2008, a study of amount of time that was spent by union employees uh, on official time. The last time this was published was in 2008, and it showed that Federal Government union employees uh, spent oh, uh, 3 million hours of official time to engage in union-related activities. This was a cost to the Federal taxpayers of about $120 million in 2008. Unfortunately, upon repeated requests by um, many, several congressmen and, and uh, the Competitive Enterprises Institute under this President, we have not received a response from that. In your perspective, States, and I will start with you, Governor Walker, do you keep track of any official business or, or union business done on official time? 
Yeah, I wouldn't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I know uh, both at the state level and we see the same thing at the local level. We certainly saw that when I was the Milwaukee County Executive. And it's an interesting cycle because taxpayers in many cases are paying taxpayers money, which not only goes to workers, but in many cases then goes to government employee, employee unions who then use that money for political purposes, who then elect candidates, who then advocate for more government and higher taxes on the middle class. It is a vicious circle. So, so you, d d Wisconsin does keep track of official time spent on union activities? There is time, for example, there is time at both the State and the local level that is designated that employ people who are employees of the government who are designated as union officials have to account for time that is taken and as part of their contracts. In many cases, we saw at the local level of the county the number of individuals who are on the payroll who are working for the unions. Uh, Governor Schumelin, is, is it the same situation in Vermont? It is not an issue in Vermont. Uh, our public employees unionized work hard and they work long days and long nights, and uh, we are certain that that is what they are doing and that is what they do with their time. You know, we are we're, uh, we're a small State where everybody knows what everyone is doing. And uh, in Vermont, we work hard and our public employees work just as hard as our private sector employees. In Florida, we are uh, deliberating now in the legislature and something that was deliberated back when I was in the legislature there, what was known as a Paycheck, Paycheck Protection Act, and it would require that the employees make an affirmative uh, acknowledgment and, 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 and confirmation that they will sign over a certain part of their paycheck to union dues instead of it just having taken out uh, uh, regularly. Is that something that has been entertained in either of your states, Governor Walker? Yeah, that is in the legislation that, uh, that I signed a law approximately a month ago. And the concept with that is, in the interest of workers, they should have the right to choose. If they want to have that money taken off, they want to, if they want to have to be a part of a union, and, and if they ultimately want to have the choices and whether or not they give that money to that union or not, they should be the one that chooses it. Uh, Governor Schumlin? It hasn't been any significant part of the debate. You know, we are really, uh, like Governor Walker, we are facing a tough economy and a tough budget challenge trying to balance it, and thanks to the largesse of Congress, the last budget deficits for all we governors haven't really had to be dealt with because we got so much money from Washington. That's over, and we got to balance our budgets the old-fashioned way. So we're making tough cuts, tough choices, and I'm doing it by focusing on what matters, which is health care costs, corrections, uh, and other areas where I have explosive growth, and I'm not worrying them too much about. Uh, union dues. And accomplishing these objectives, whether they be uh, pro union or anti union, whatever they may be, requires people to come to the bargaining table. It requires people to come to consensus or compromise. And one of the issues that we saw in Wisconsin was that there were senators on the Democrat side who left the State and failed to come to the table to address. And as a public official, as one who is elected, I take personal offense to somebody who abrogates their responsibility by not owning up to uh, their obligations to make these decisions, as difficult as they may be. And so, Governor Schumel, I would ask you, do you condone such activities where elected officials leave the State or uh, abrogate their responsibilities to, to, uh, uh, to enforce their obligations as an elected official? Well, I got to tell you, uh, I got my hands filled dealing with the challenges that I am facing in Vermont, and I don't comment much on what is happening in the other 49 States. I am just focused on what is happening in Vermont. In Vermont, everyone uh, is working together with lots of maple syrup to get tough things done. Thank you. Governor Walker? Yeah, obviously, I have great concern. When I talked to factory workers over the last month or two, I pointed out if you walked off the job for three weeks, you wouldn't be working there anymore. Uh, I think that is pretty clear out there. So I think there is a, a, a real uh, challenge. And obviously, the individuals in those 14 Senate districts are going to decide whether or not that makes right. a difference long term. But you said something else about working together. And I, I believe in that. Uh, but I also believe more important than working together is people want results. And so in the beginning of this year, we worked together with Democrats and Republicans and one independent we have in the legislature. We passed some of the most aggressive job-creating legislation in the country. We showed that Wisconsin was open for business. But sometimes working together is a problem. In the past, Democrats and Republicans worked together and they pushed the problem off to the future. And at some point, leaders, no matter what party they are in, have to stand up and up say, we have got to do something about it. And that is what we are doing here. Thank you. And I yield back. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welsh, for his question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Governor Shumlin, I see that seated behind you is Matt Vincy, uh, who is a leader of a public employees union, the firefighters. He is sitting next to his brother uh, from Wisconsin. Uh, you are the Governor. Uh, he is public employee union. Did one of you not get the mem memo that you are not supposed to get along? 
I guess I don't know if I didn't get it, but uh, all I can tell you is we get along great, as you know, and uh, there is nothing better than our firefighters working hard for us and sacrificing their lives for us every single day. You know, as I have listened to Governor Walker describe his problems, uh, it sounds to me very similar to what you described to me this morning when we had breakfast as to the problems you face in Vermont. I mean, governors cannot escape the consequences of the greatest uh, recession that we have had uh, since the Depression. And th that recession is brutal and shows no mercy, whether it is a Republican governor-led state or a Democratic governor-led state. Uh, you have described your approach. Uh, but clearly uh, there are points of real contention that you have to deal with as governor. Uh, you have got a legislature that is pushing you uh, and you are resisting to raise revenues. Uh, uh, you have got public employees who, yeah, they did cooperate, but on the other hand, they have got to represent their members and, and uh, stand up for uh, wages and, and benefits. Uh, just maybe give a brief summary of how you managed to get from here to there. And then I want to be able to talk to Governor uh, Walker, too, and I don't have that much time. So. I will try to be very brief. You know, really, uh, as you know, <laughs> my guess is that my approach isn't much different than other governors across the country. We are trying to create jobs and economic opportunities. As I mentioned, the middle class has been kicked in the teeth over this recession, harder than I think they have been kicked in years, and we are trying to find ways to raise their income. And uh, we do that by going after real savings in health care. Uh, by going after the recidivism in our corrections budget, it is costing taxpayers $47,000 a year. We have a very high recidivism rate. And by going where the real money is while we resist raising taxes so that we can actually grow jobs and economic opportunities. And you heard Governor Walker talk about wishing to import jobs from Illinois, and we are all doing that. I am hoping to bring in a few jobs from New Hampshire and Massachusetts and New York as we manage our budget and we are a great place to do business, work, raise a family, the best place in the country, in my judgment. Okay. But we do it by getting along and by using common sense and reasonableness. Let me ask Governor Walker. We, I just want to make an observation. We have a problem here in Congress. Uh, and there's, in my, this is my own personal observation about serving for five years. There is too much of a winner-take-all attitude. Because uh, when I hear my Republican colleagues say we have got to deal with spending, uh, I happen to think they are right. Uh, but I also think we have to look at other things, too, like the tax code uh, in, 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 in revenues. I would say that quite candidly, a lot of disagreement from some of my colleagues. But one of our problems in Congress is a winner-take-all approach where even if you, quote, win, and we see this with the health care debate, the Democrats, quote, won on health care last year, but uh, now the first act of the new Congress is to repeal it. If you win in a way where the other side feels they didn't have a seat at the table or things were crammed down. And both sides can be, you know, doing this. There is a price because you end up winning on the vote, but you don't make progress on the policy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously you were the Senate, your state was the center of the storm with a very hard confrontation between two sides. And I am asking if you would just observe or, or, or comment uh, on your thoughts about whether there is a price that may be paid uh, in your state as a result of the fact that uh, the approach that was taken uh, did result in this enormous confrontation and a lot of controversy and a lot of pain that continues even after uh, your policy, I think, was uh, prevailed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the results obviously were frustrating. Uh, one of the things that frustrated them the most is I think if you were going to participate in democracy, you got to be in the arena. And when 14 of my colleagues in the Capitol decided to leave for three weeks, it made it pretty difficult to do that. Uh, in fact, in particular, one of them, someone we would worked with before on jobs initiatives, spent a good chunk of that time trying to work with us. And as he revealed in the Wisconsin State Journal a week ago Sunday, he was closer to us than he was to his other colleagues. My hope is that people like him and others will continue to come to the table and work on our jobs agenda, the things we need to continue to do. I think we will be on the right track. But again, I go back to what I said before. People want us to work together, but they want that because they want results. When I look at what Mitch Daniels did six years ago in Indiana, essentially for the State, he did what we are proposing or what we proposed in this legislation to do. His numbers were far below mine. Um, in that first year, the first six months he was in office, uh, he was dealing with some of the same passions, just not as big, because he did it through an executive order, not through a piece of legislation. Uh, but four years later, he was reelected with 58 percent of the vote, because in the end, people saw the results. All the fears didn't materialize, and the results proved that in that state the government got better, it got more efficient, it got more effective, and ultimately good public employees in Indiana were rewarded. Okay. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman, uh, Mr. Kelly, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And both governors, thank you for being here. I come from the private sector, so I understand a little bit about having your own skin in the game and being able to sign the front half of a check. I, kn I know that sometimes down here we lose perspective about whose money it is we are spending. And I got to tell you, when somebody else is picking up the tab, it is easy to keep saying, go ahead and keep on partying. Now, I want to ask you this specifically, because the Chairman started off with a discussion, also Mr. Shevitz, about defined benefits in pensions. And I know in Pennsylvania that while all of us took a hit when the stock market went down with our pensions and we lost quite a bit of it, at the end of the day, that was a loss. If you can, in both your states, tell me about who makes up the loss for the benefit that is calculated after. And I really think defined benefits is a, is a complete illusion. It gives us the, the, uh, the belief that somehow the future is both predictable and reliable, and we, both, we all know it isn't. So please tell me the deficiency, the difference between what the defined benefit is based on what the actuaries are saying and the actuality of it. Who makes up the difference for that? You know, I think it is really important uh, to stick with the facts. And the fact of the matter is, if you look at Vermont, this is what happened. In the worst stock market crash in a long time, we mm -hmm. watched it go from roughly 12,000 to 6,000 to down. The average person in a defined contribution plan sold their stocks when they got discouraged somewhere between 8 and 6,000. Those who were in defined benefit plans had people like Vermont advising them to hold on and hold out, and that is what we did. So now our retirement plans are higher than they were in the depths of the loss. The average small investor now has lost what they saved for retirement. So again, it is a great example where a defined benefit plan protects workers more ably than a defined contribution plan, and Vermont's example is exactly a proof of that theory. Okay, but my, my question is, who makes up the difference in a loss? My point is there was no loss. We have gotten the gains back. The, I, I understand so, what you are saying, but there is somebody who does provide the safety net, and we both know that, Governor Walker. Yeah, it is taxpayers. Uh, and, yeah. and, 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 and in our case, before these reforms, uh, you have talked a lot today about, for example, my proposal of the 5.8 percent contribution. One of the things I want to make clear, because it is different than Vermont and other states, before this reform, other than literally a handful of State employees, the taxpayers were picking up both the employee contribution and the employer. So I am not upping the employee contribution. I am actually having the employees of the State, including me, actually pay the employee contribution. Again, something that is done in the private sector, as you know, yeah. the employer pays part, the employer pays the other part. Uh, and what I found when I was traveling the state in the midst of this debate, when I, particularly when I go to uh, manufacturing plants, and guys you know, point out they are paying 25 to 50 percent of their health insurance premiums. Most of them, if they have a retirement plan, it wasn't a pension, it was a 401 k yeah. And many of them, to keep people working, were suspending the employer match just to be able to keep people from being laid off. That is the reality of it. And then when I would walk them through what I was asking, because they would see the ads and they would think, hey, wait a minute, you are taking all this money away. Just as an example, in, in the f basic family plan that my family has, we will go up to pay about $200 a month in premiums versus about $90 a month. Right. Again, most people in the private sector, middle class taxpayers wonder, wow, that is unbelievable. Yeah. Well, I, and I have got to tell you, I, and I think that is the more important thing to understand. If I have a defined benefit, then I can go ahead and stick with that plan because come hell or high water, I am still going to get my defined benefit. But when you are in a person whose real money, their money is in the program, and you have a choice to opt out now and try to keep what you have or lose it, then you are really put in a, in a box. And, and I think there's, most people in this country don't understand. Now, my daughter is a teacher. My wife is a teacher. I have got a lot of friends whose, whose benefits are guaranteed. And they are guaranteed by people in the private sector who will see a raise in their taxes to cover the loss in these pensions. And I think that is where the divide comes. This is not about union workers versus non-union workers, Republicans versus Democrats. This is about Americans. And if we are going to share the gains and we are going to also participate in the pain, we better understand that when you have your own money in the game, it is a vast difference between somebody who is guaranteed a benefit regardless of what they put in. And that is the important thing. Taxpayers make up the difference in all these losses. That is the model and that is what is wrong with it. You don't have a safety net in your private plan. But the public sector does, or the, the, uh, the public sector does, and I think that is, is a vast difference, and I think it makes it a lot easier to stick with a plan that is upside down and say, you know what, I will go ahead and write it out because 
one way or the other, I'm still made whole. Thank you so much for both of you being here. I appreciate it. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Governors. Um, Governor Shumlin, did I understand in your testimony that you said that uh, the pension fund in Vermont has an 8, 8.5 percent return, annual return? That's correct. That's what we've had over time. And I think it's really important to address the question of who pays. And the statement just made that taxpayers do. At least in Vermont, maybe we're unique. I don't think so. 80 percent of the benefits that we pay out are paid for by return on investment. 80 percent? That's correct. So um, is it you are a member of the National Governors Association? Excuse me? You are a member of the National Governors yes. Association. Um, is it your understanding from your fellow governors that uh, Vermont is unique and that most State pension funds are, in fact, underwater or about to go so? Uh, it is not my understanding that most are underwater, no. Mr. Chairman, um, I would ask unanimous consent to enter into the record correspondence provided by the National League of Cities, NACO, uh, NASACT, ICMA, NSRA, and a number of other organizations pointing out, as a matter of fact, that most State pension systems are very solvent and have been for the, uh, quite stable for the last half century. Uh, uh, have they been received uh, by the uh, parliamentarian yet? Uh, I don't, I have the, they been received by the parliamentarian? All right. We have copies here, Mr. Chairman. Okay. We'll, uh, they will bring them up. We will reserve and, and make a final decision by the end of the uh, hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Governor Walker, um, you uh, when you campaigned for governor, did you campaign on the issue of collective bargaining being a problem with respect to the Wisconsin's budget? I talked about wages and benefits overall, even ran campaign ads on it, but I didn't specify exactly what form. I talked about the broad spectrum. And in fact, AFT Wisconsin, one of the unions that objected to being on this, actually ran campaign flyers pointing out some of my statements about collective bargaining, mediation, arbitration, and other issues. So uh, that was an issue that uh, was a part of the campaign. Explicitly? Again, I didn't run an ad saying I'm going to do exactly this, but I talked about the full well, range. In fact, talked about it in a couple of the debates well, about the fact that the full spectrum of issues. Good. That's what I. You know, I had 43 debates when I ran for re-election yep. last year. That's a lot of debates. I didn't have that many. I'm glad. Probably more than most <laughs> members of this uh, this body. That's impressive. Uh, and I enjoyed every one of them. Uh, but That's also more than most members. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but. Did collective bargaining, you, you, in your debates with your opponent, you actually brought up collective bargaining and said that is something I am going to address if elected governor? I talked about the whole spectrum. I talked specifically about the 5 and the 12 percent. They said, how far are you willing to go? I said, I am willing to change the law from one end of the spectrum, whether it is a modest change or an outright change. I talked about it there. I talked about it again in the transition. Well, I talked well, about it. Governor, governor Walker, I am asking a very specific question. Yeah. Did you explicitly no. single out no. no. I talked so, about the so full it, range. It might be, you might concede that some might be surprised then that you made collective bargaining such a uh, centerpiece of your so called reform efforts when you, after you were sworn in. No, and I would say no, because for eight years as county executive, I not only talked about it, I actually brought it up. I did what was called a reality tour, where I talked about the challenges okay. that we were unsustainable and that collective bargaining so, was driving that. So from your point of view, um, nobody should have been surprised once you were That's elected and sworn in. 100 percent correct. Uh, were you then surprised at the reaction it generated in your state? Not in my state. For eight years, I took on the status quo in a county that's never elected a Republican before. I was elected with 54, then 57, then 59 percent, because I think in times of crisis, uh, people aren't so much concerned about Republican or Democrat. They want leadership, and that's what we took on. Uh, that's what we're trying to do at the state level. What did surprise me, uh, uh, candidly, was the the level of national attention. The folks that came in from Washington and others to be a part of that debate. Thank you. Um, let me ask a quick question. Uh, you got a famous phone call from somebody pretending to be David Koch mm -hmm. uh, or Koch or however one pronounces it, mm -hmm. um, and he said, "Well, I tell you what, Scott." Once you crush these bastards, I'll fly you out to Cali and really show you a good time. You responded to that by saying, all right, that would be outstanding. What did you mean by that? And what did you think he meant? At that point, I was done on the call. I had two other people waiting for me, and I was trying to get off the call and get on to the next issue. It, it wasn't that you honestly thought it was Mr. 
Koch and that he was uh, promising to reward you for what you were doing? Did in not, in that regard, no. The uh, flying out to Kali thing didn't strike you? No. I don't even know where Kali is. Have you uh, ever had a conversation um, with respect to your actions in Wisconsin uh, in using them to punish uh, members of the opposition party and their donor base? No. You have never had such a conversation? No. Thank you. My time no, again, is up. I have spent uh, eight years talking about the challenges of the county official, the fact that I had a union or a series of unions in Milwaukee County who constantly told me to play people off as opposed to making modest changes. Thank you. My time is up. Thank you, Mr. Dejale, uh, Dr. Desjolais. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Governors, for being here today. Uh, Governor Walker, I believe uh, your state, my home state of Tennessee, has constitutional requirements to balance the budget. Uh, obviously, that constitutional requirement does not exist in Washington, D.C. Do you believe that these constitutional requirements give you additional support and leverage you need to make the difficult decisions that need to be made to get your fiscal spending under control? Yes, and, and I think both of us as governors talk about the fact that as governors, even regardless of party, um, for us to succeed and to have states that grow the economy, we have to have a balanced budget. Whether there is a constitutional requirement, a legal requirement or otherwise, I think the states that are going to succeed, regardless of who the governors, are the states that take their fiscal challenges head on. Okay, thank you. Uh, this last election, it was pretty clear to me, coming from the private sector, that the American people uh, have sent a referendum that they feel government overall is too large and it is too intrusive and it is in the way of creating jobs. And so, yeah, I take heed to that as we sit in these hearings and we justify a lot of the programs within the Federal Government, whether they are good or not, and we had discussions whether or not private sector versus public se sector pay is fair. Uh, Governor Walker, how would you gauge the pay and benefits afforded to the public sector, sector workers in Wisconsin? Uh, Critics have said that your reforms are hurting a group of workers that are already worse off than their private sector counterparts. Are they wrong? Well, uh, let, me, let me just point out two quick things on that. One, uh, this debate to me has never been about the level of pay or compensation, because I think there are great people who work at the city, the county, our school district, state government. I have said that repeatedly. What this is about is balancing the budget and making sure we can do it long term and giving our state and local governments the tools. Now, there have been plenty of studies. There are studies all over the map. There are studies that show that whether you have a higher education degree or not, whether it is higher or lower. Uh, I think the key is, again, if you look at when I have toured the state, when I talk to the constituents I have, and I talk to people in the middle class working in our factories and farms and other locations, they realize they are the ones that foot the bill for more and more government. And they think it is realistic that if they are paying on average 20 percent for health care, they are paying something for their pension or their 401 k or whatever they might have, they think it is realistic that the rest of us who work in the government pay something similar to that. Thank you. Uh, Governor Shumlin, you had mentioned in your testimony earlier that uh, you went to where the money was to help uh, get your fiscal house in order, and uh, you mentioned health care. I was wondering if you had some insight that you could share with us to uh, how, that, how you went about that and if you have a solution to the health care crisis and, and the cost. Wow. Well, how long do we have? Uh, the answer is yes, we are working very hard to pass a health care bill that will be the first in the country where health care is a right and not a privilege where it follows the individual, is not required by the employer, which we think will be a huge jobs creator, but most importantly, as Governor Walker suggested earlier when he was talking about health care, where we actually reimburse providers based upon keeping people healthy, health care outcomes, instead of the fee-for-service model. And uh, we have put together an ambitious plan. We are passing the Senate at, almost as we speak. It has already passed the House, so I am going to sign it into law. And then we are going to come down to Congress and beg you for a few waivers. And uh, so I am so glad we have this opportunity to start begging now. Okay. Uh, we will be interested to see how that turns out, because we certainly have our challenges here. Uh, do you uh, believe that collective bargaining is really a basic human right? I believe it is a basic right in a democratic society. And, you know, I say that as a guy who uh, grew up in the, born and raised in Vermont. Mm -hmm. uh, my ancestors, like so many of us probably in this room, came to this country with nothing, passed through Ellis Island, ended up uh, picking beets, my great grandfather, great great grandfather, out in the Midwest somewhere. And uh, frankly, were it not for the right to collectively bargain, I don't believe that my relatives or most middle class Americans 
would have the opportunities for economic progress that they enjoy today. Okay. You had made a comment outside the National Governors Association meeting that the ability to collectively bargain is a basic human right in democracy. Now, this is in direct contradiction with uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who was a pro-union uh, person, and he said meticulous attention should be paid to the special relations and obligations of public servants to the public itself and to the government. The process of collective bargaining, as usually understood, cannot be transplanted into public surface, service. And he goes on to say, a strike of public employees manifests nothing less than intent on their part to obstruct the operations of government until their demands are satisfied. Can you comment on that? I just say that even someone as great as Roosevelt could be wrong once. Uh, I, I might disagree on that point, but uh, my time is out, and I thank you for your comments. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I want to acknowledge my colleague, Mr. Murphy, from Connecticut. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, both governors. Thank you for uh, your attendance uh, today and for uh, sticking with us throughout this uh, process. Um, I, I guess I just have a, a simple statement and, and question for you, uh, Governor Walker. I guess for those of us that have been watching uh, this debate play out, and I think this has, uh, you know, been covered by several of my colleagues. It's it's hard to uh, it's hard to square. Uh, the concessions that have been made by the unions, their willingness to come to the table, and the uh, continued drive uh, to strip them of collective bargaining uh, uh, rights. And obviously, there has been a lot of conversation around the country as to how this plays in to a, a much broader debate uh, that is happening uh, around the nation. Uh, and uh, when we look at the amounts of outside money that has been spent in Wisconsin, uh, both with, with, with respect uh, to your election, to the fight over uh, the legislation, uh, and then most recently in the uh, last few weeks uh, with respect to this election uh, for the Court. Uh, it, it's hard to make the argument that this uh, uh, debate only plays out in the context of Wisconsin's budget fight. Um, and in fact, some of the key players in this drama seem to be pretty open uh, about how this is ultimately about trying to kill a pretty uh, important constituency for working families. Now, I think we had this quote on the uh, board earlier when Mr. Connolly was asking his questions, but um, let me read it aloud. Um, uh, the State Senate leader, Scott Fitzgerald, said recently during an interview on Fox News, he said, quote, if we win this battle, and the money is not there under the auspices of the unions. Certainly what you are going to find is President Obama is going to have a much more difficult time getting elected and winning the State of Wisconsin. And in an email uh, solicitation or in a fundraising letter, excuse me, that he uh, sent out, uh, he was making the pitch that Republicans should be supported because they faced down big Labor's bully tactics and a Democratic walkout in the State Senate to break the power of unions uh, in Wisconsin once uh, and for all. This sounds a lot like a much broader political fight to try to defeat your opponents, to try to defeat uh, the advocates for working families. And I, I guess um, I am sure you have a good answer to this question. But uh, I would like to know if you uh, agree with the statements of your State Senate leader, Scott Fitzgerald, and, and, and how you address the concern of many of ours uh, that the reason that you have uh, $2.1 million being spent on behalf of uh, your candidate for the court, the reason that you have groups like the Koch brothers pouring uh, in uh, thousands and thousands of dollars, because uh, this is about a much broader effort. And it seems that some of the key players in the fight, uh, um, certainly in the State legislative level, are very open uh, about how this is uh, a much broader assault on unions and the allies uh, of unions. And I guess I, I, I specifically want to know if you, uh, if you disagree um, with that very specific statement made by uh, the Senate leader. Two things. One, I think uh, any uh, outside observer of politics in our State would probably jump to that conclusion for all the parties involved. They would look at the $4 million the unions pumped in during the debate and the TV ads that went on. They would look at the money you referenced and others and say outside of Wisconsin there is a lot of people who are viewing this in a larger context. Except this fight wasn't, I, I could, start, wasn't started by Labor. Well, this fight was, no, this but, fight was but, started did by Did you just ask about the money? And I fairly recognize that. I want to put in context that there is a lot of money all the way around coming from all sorts of sources, and I think a lot of whom are, are looking at multiple reasons for this. I can't answer for Scott Fitzgerald. I can't for others. I can answer for Scott Walker. And I can tell you, for me, it is about, certainly in part, about the budget. 
uh, but it is also ultimately about making government work better and, and, and I think protecting, when I talk about the middle class, it is not just the paying middle class, it is even middle class uh, individuals who work for State and local government. Because for us, we ultimately believe, and we have seen the alternative, which we are protecting middle class jobs by avoiding what other, many other States are doing with massive layoffs at both the State and the local level, and by ultimately putting in place a system where the government is going to work better, where, particularly for schools. I have got two kids in a public school. I care very deeply about it. I would like to have a system, like we do elsewhere in society, where we pay for performance, not just reward based on seniority. I would like to have people based on merit and performance. This measure, these reforms empower us to keep our best teachers in the schools, to keep our best city and county and state workers in place. And that is part of the package as well. My time is almost up, but I understand you can't speak for him. But you can certainly opine as to whether you agree with uh, your State Senate leader when he says that this is uh, ultimately about trying to defeat President Obama in Wisconsin. Um, do you agree with, with that? I can tell you what it is for me. It is not about that. It is ultimately about balancing the budget now and in the future, not just in the temporary, because we have had too many people temporarily trying to push our problems off to the future. This is a long-term answer, and it is about long-term reform in our government so our schools, our local governments, and our states operate better. That is what it is for me. There are millions of dollars being pumped into the state who disagree with that, uh, with that vision, but I appreciate your answer. Thank you very much. I thank my colleague. I want to acknowledge my colleague, Mr. Gowdy from South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Governor Shumlin, uh, I noted the uh, conciliatory tone in both your introduction and your uh, opening statement. I've, I made a couple of notes. Uh, you uh, mentioned the Unity Tour, which uh, I found uh, inspiring. You said, come to the table. You mentioned the word reasonableness and openness. And on four different occasions, you said, come together. My question to you is, how do you do that when the side with whom you disagree has absconded from the state? and is essentially a fugitive from responsibility. What table do you sit at when you are not in the same state? Well, you know, you don't uh, apply the reasonableness plea in the heat of the crisis. You avert the crisis. And I will just tell you, by way of our experience, uh, under the Republican Governor Jim Douglas, uh, we needed to get roughly $25 million out of our pensions for teachers to balance our budget. And, uh, things weren't going so well in those negotiations with the Governor. So the Democratic Senate President, myself, and the Democratic Speaker sat down with the union and said, listen, we are going to have to get these savings and we can do it with you or we can do it without you and really we would like to do it with you. And they turned to us and said, we want to do it with you. So my point is, when you are going to work together, when you are going to do what the American people want most desperately from their politicians, and God knows they want it from Washington right now, and so do I, reasonableness, compromise, common sense, you got to start with that foot. You can't ask for it once you have created a crisis. But there is a concept of mutuality that, that is inherent or required for that to happen. I, I know you would agree with me. I, I also want to say in, inherent in your comments to me and in your testimony, frankly, um, is uh, civility. Right. In the last two weeks alone, uh, members of this body have been told by a colleague to go to hell, uh, not purgatory, not Sheol, not Hades, not the River Styx, but hell. Uh, we have been told that we want to kill women. Um, and my colleague from Virginia just made reference to a surreptitious phone call that was placed to an elected official. Will you help me and join me in decrying the rhetoric and the tactics that I just laid out? You know, I think that uh, civility has to be applied to all public officials. And I think that we need to raise the bar collectively. And it applies to Washington, it applies to State governments. Uh, across this country, uh, we Do have Do you think making surreptitious phone calls, pretending to be someone you are not, um, enhances civility and discourse in this country? All I can say is I have no disagreeing with you that the civility tunnel runs both ways, and we all have a responsibility as public servants, and the American people expect it for us to be civil all the time. You, uh, in response to Dr. Desjardins, I think, and again, I always allow for the possibility somebody may have been misquoted, uh, collective bargain, the ability to collectively bargain is a basic human right in democracy. What is your authority for that statement? What is your constitutional authority for saying that? Well, 
free speech, for starters. <laughs> <laughs> Beyond your ability to say it, where would you where would you point me in the Constitution for support for the underlying notion? You know, uh, it is my belief, as a governor of a state, that collective bargaining is a right and something that has served this country with extraordinary progress and distinction, and it's allowed, as I mentioned, families like mine, who came from nothing, to succeed economically in the best democracy, in the best economy, in the best business climate that anyone could ever design. So all I can say is I see it as a basic right. Are there exceptions? We are allowed to organize. Are there exceptions? Not that I can think of. Law enforcement? I think law enforcement should be able to collectively bargain just like anybody else. And they have in our state, and it has had great results. In my state of South Carolina, we laid off prosecutors, law enforcement officers and teachers. We furloughed them for five days um, last year uh, because we have a, a fiscal crisis like almost every other state. Is that something that you would entertain in your state? Could you ever see furloughing the core functions of government, which I just all three of those categories are? Could you ever see that happening? Uh, we actually did. Uh move our courts from a five-day a week to a four-day a week. Uh, I would not for Your federal courts are state, because the federal judges state. have always been on a four-day well, week. We have noticed our state judges. <laughs> state judges. Uh, I see my time is up. Thank you. I thank the member. I acknowledge uh, my uh, colleague, Mr. Tierney, from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you, Governors, for being here today. Governor Shumlin, let me just ask you, when you were trying to resolve your fiscal problems in the state, did you start off uh, with the unions by telling them that you were going to uh, require them to hold annual votes to continue representing the government employees, that you were going to no longer deduct union dues from the employees' paycheck, uh, and then expect them to come to the table and start a really good, solid conversation with you. Is that the way you began your conversation? No, Congressman Tierney, that is not, that's not what I led with. Okay. Uh, I, do, I just think that is a point worth making. But let me also ask you, what percentage of your, um, your annual State uh, government spending is the contributions to your uh, pension accounts? It is about 4 percent. And, uh, you know, I think it is important that we remember that. Uh, you know, when I talk about the real challenge as a governor having to balance a budget, my health care costs are going up at double digits. My corrections budget has doubled. My challenge is not pensions. Of course, it is a consideration. But our pension funds are now performing quite well, and we are doing okay. And, Governor Walker, what percentage of uh, your State um, spending is related to the pensions account? If you look overall, and I don't know the exact percentage off my top of my head, but, well, then the, let me ask but, you this, but I can give you the numbers, what they are, and you can I'd figure out the percentage. I prefer you give me the percentage, but if you don't know that, is it significantly more or less than the 4 percent? Well, the, the total budget for the next biennium is about $600 billion, or excuse me, $60 billion. The total amount of savings that we have from the reforms we put in is 1.4 you know, for this. I don't choose to answer the question. I, I, look, the National Association of State Retirement Administrators says that less than 3 percent of all State and local government spending is generally used to fund public pension funds. Governor Schumer, you are at 4 percent, so you think that is generally roughly right? That is correct. Governor Walker, do you want to make an opinion one way or the other? Again, or I, take I can pass on it because you are just. I can follow up and, and give you the percentage I would based on the numbers. I would do that. Thank you. Uh, we talked just a second, we could, Governor Shumlin, about the defined benefit versus the defined contribution on that. Uh, from your earlier conversation, my understanding is that you, you recognize that when you switch from the defined benefit to the defined contribution, there is a tremendous shift in the risk to the beneficiary. Am I right? Risk and cost. Right. And, and they both go he more heavily onto the shoulders of the employee, correct? And the taxpayers for the, the short taxpayers. term. All right. Uh, and basically, generally in your State, I think in others, that when these, uh, this original situation was set up, uh, that was part of the bargaining process, that the employee may have taken less in pay or some other uh, area they were negotiating on in return for uh, having a little more security uh, in retirement. Am I right? That is the promise that was made. Okay. And so it was the employer uh, making that deal as well as the employee? That is correct. It seems like a fair deal to you, a fair yes. thing to negotiate on that. All right. Let me ask both of you, if I could, uh, on that. Do either of you uh, uh, ask for the authority for bankruptcy for your respective states? No. no. Governor Schumer? No. Okay. Uh, do either of you believe that bankrupt a bankruptcy court is better able to overcome political differences uh, than the political process in your state, the governors and, and legislature? No. No. Okay. 
Uh, do either of you think that, uh, that the bankruptcy court is better able to restore fiscal stability in your respective States? No. No. Okay. And do either of you think that the bankruptcy court would be a better manager of your State's finances? No. No. Okay. Uh, so you both agree with the, the letter, the terminal letter that uh, Governor Gregoire, who is a Democrat from Washington, and uh, Governor Heineman, who is a Republican from um, Nebraska, uh, sent to congressional leaders that essentially made that point. I said their letter said that allowing States to declare bankruptcy is not an authority that any State leader has asked for, nor would they likely use it. States are sovereign entities in which the public trust is granted to its elected leaders. Uh, the reported bankruptcy proposals suggest that a bankruptcy court is better able to overcome political differences, restore fiscal stability, and manage the finances of a State. And these assertions are false and serve only to threaten the fabric of State and local finance. Would each of you gentlemen be uh, pretty much in agreement with that con uh, comment? That is the NGA's position, and I support it. Uh, I, agree. I agree. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would the gentleman yield? Would the gentleman yield? Let's go back to you, um, Governor Schumann. You know, the, the, as I listened to, you know, you were talking about the maple syrup and whatever and your methodology. There was one word that you left out. And the reason why I think you got the cooperation that you got is because of respect. The workers felt that you respected them. I, I heard your story, and I wouldn't be here either if it were not from unions. No doubt about it. Um, my, for, my parents were former sharecroppers. Manning, South Carolina, came to Baltimore, got a union job, and that is why I am here today. So I just wanted to know, and they felt respected. I appreciate your comment. And obviously, <clears throat> respect for our fire, firefighters, for, the, for our police officers, for the folks that risk their lives every day, for the folks plowing the roads, and all of our public employees is incredibly important to any chief executive. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gowdy. I'm sorry, the gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gosar. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to get back to our original uh, topic here about uh, state and municipal debt. Um, we're not talking apples to apples in your states. I mean, let me get this right. Um, you actually are a tax giver to the Federal Government, and you're a tax taker from the Federal Government, if I'm not mistaken, right? For every dollar of tax, you get only 82 cents back, and Vermont gets a dollar 12 back, right? You know, uh, I'm an expert on the cheese in our states, not the apples. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> well, apples and cheese go along with wine and maple yeah, syrup. That's true. Um, but there's a difference. So there's well, my link here is is I'm coming back to the, the basic core problem with all states is the federal mandate and things that some of the states should be doing, right? Particularly, Governor Shumlin, you talk about health care and corrections. Isn't that a Tenth Amendment right? Wouldn't you like, don't you like the ability to have some flexibility in regards to those oversight of those funds? Well, yes, frankly, but you need to define what we mean by flexibility, <clears throat> because my fear is as we have this. And well, part of let, if I, I think you're going there. If, you know? if, I, if I can just finish what I, what I was saying, as we get a little bit uh, towards the next budget discussion, is that flexibility means we're going to leave the requirements and take the money on behalf of the Federal Government, and the States are going to be in tougher shape than we're in already with under under reimbursements from Medicaid and Medicare. Well, and, and I understand because with the unfunded mandate, there is this hidden cost that no one wants to talk about, and that is is. For that Federal law to be enacted in a State, we hire more workers that are not on the private sector, they are on the public sector. And therefore, these roles continually go up. And so part of this is based upon, or the majority of, of if I look across the board, coming from Arizona, and holy cow, we will get to those numbers here in a second. Um, but the problem is, is the budget problems in each of the States are derived by the unfunded mandate by the Federal Government. You know, I, I think that is an oversimplification. I think the budget challenges in the States are derived from the worst recession in American history that was brought on by a lot of greed on Wall Street and the housing bubble that got transferred to Main Street. That was the corp culprit. Oh, I, I got to stop you there. <clears throat> because didn't we also have a problem with the Federal Government in that? Didn't the Federal Government establish itself in the risk pool and, and, and all the aspects of risk telling the regulators and telling the banks and telling the financiers, 
you will do this. So there's, there's equal well, blame to go around, and that's not I, where we want to go about. All right, but I, I would actually argue that uh, if we want to get into that, that it was the, regulate, it was the lack of regulation of Thank Wall you. Street that led us to the crisis. And that's government. Once yes. again, government problems, and, and coming from the Federal Government. But my get, what I'm trying to get back to is it's not an oversimplification, because when we're telling you a rule, if, if it is intrinsic, intrinsic to the Federal Government's mission, do you think they ought to pass a buck to you or they should fully fund it? I think the Federal Government should keep its promises to the States. And are you prepared to, to honor those promises to communities? Absolutely. Okay. So when we are talking about health care and corrections, I am kind of having a problem here on um, where this unfunded mandate is coming from, because it, we constantly are kicking the can down the wall or down the, the road. And these are the core principal problems that you brought up, is health care and corrections. Well, you know, it isn't the mandates, and we don't have Federal mandates standing away in a way of corrections that are really a budget challenge. On health care, we oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, I, I've got a famous sheriff out in my neck, neck of the woods that the Federal Government is breathing down his neck and telling him, yes, you can do that, no, you can't do that. So there is some, some oversight um, in regards to the Federal Government that, that dictates exactly how you can incarcerate a, a prisoner or, or how you have to go through a process, does it not? I don't see it as a cost driver in my State budget. Hmm. How about you? How do you feel, Governor Walker? Well, well, there is no doubt that not only the mandates on the federal, from the Federal Government to the State Government, but many times the mandates that then go on to the local governments are driven largely by the mandates that start here. And to the extent that we get more freedom and flexibility, and one thing the Governor said earlier, I would concur with as well, is I would love to have a block grant. I want to make sure that that doesn't mean that that is just say, here, have it, now we are going to cut it in half either. I realize that we have got, you know, there is a core group of people on things that related to Medicaid. But I do believe if you put the power back in the hands of the people at the, at, at the State level, States are better equipped to tackle those challenges. Um, and in turn, can, you know, one State versus another State is going to have very different needs and very different outcomes. And the more that we can adjust to that and not have a one-size-fits-all, the better off we are going to be. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. The gentlelady from New York, Mrs. Maloney. Oh, she's returned. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Spear. Thank you, Ms. Maloney, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you both for your participation here today. I don't know that I would have done this if I were the two of you, but I'm glad that you have. Um, let me start off with um, Governor Walker. I have here a, um, a website, www.standwithwalker.com, that is uh, supported by the Americans for Prosperity. And it is, of course, a, um, a funded by the Koch brothers. And in it, they say the following. When public sector workers gain sweetheart contracts filled with plush benefits unheard of in the private sector, the taxpayer loses every time. Do you agree with that statement? I haven't seen that statement before, but I know, as one of your colleagues asked me earlier, who pays, for example, for the pensions and things of that nature? It's the taxpayers. So I don't know about that statement in particular, but you know, conceptually, who pays for the pension and health care benefits? It's taxpayers, including public sector uh, employees who are taxpayers as well. Well, these are quick facts about Wisconsin's budget repair legislation. The second point is respecting the public trust. When teachers choose not to teach purely to pad their already lavish contracts, do you believe that statement, that they have lavish contracts? Lavish contracts? No. Again, I, you were in here earlier, but I was asked about that as well, and I pointed out to me this is not about, I forget which of your colleagues, one of the doctors asked whether I thought public employees were paid too little or too, or too much or too little, and I said that's, what this, that's not what this is about. This is about trying to balance the budget and provide long-term reforms that make government work better. One well, other let me ask you this, excuse hmm? me for reclaiming my time. Uh, do you think the teachers in Wisconsin are paid adequately? Uh, if we could set up a system where we rewarded based on performance and merit, I would even be willing to pay more. Well, let but me we don't have that system right now. We have one solely based on do you, seniority. Do you know what the starting teacher salary is in Wisconsin? Starting, it depends on the district. I know, for example, in the Milwaukee Public School System, the total compensation package uh, for an average employee is about $101,000. Well, the starting teacher salary in Wisconsin is $25,222. 
And Wisconsin ranks 49th in the nation in terms of starting salaries for teachers. And, and the reason for that is because that talks about starting, starting salaries, not total benefit packages. So, for example, if you are in a school district like many where they don't pay anything for health care, uh, that is an added benefit in terms of what the costs are. You are 49th in the nation in what you pay your school teachers. Now, um, let us talk about um, contributions. How, how much have you received in contributions from the Koch brothers? From the Koch brothers? None directly that I know of. There are probably other groups that have supported us, but I don't know what the total is. Well, I am under the impression you received $43,000 from the Koch brothers during your gubernatorial campaign. Could be. I had 50,000 contributors. I couldn't tell you who well they are. Did, did you take the phone calls of all those 50,000 contributors when um, you were in the middle of that crisis? I talked to a whole lot of people every day. All right. Um, Let us move on to uh, Governor Shumlin. I was really impressed by one of the statements, many of the statements you made, but one in particular in which you said that Wall Street really believes that this um, crisis creation is really relative to the states and their, uh, their potential bankruptcy is really a figment of um, the imaginations of some who are politically motivated to create that kind of angst. Could you expound on that a little bit? Sure. And, and I want to be careful, because if I misspoke, I want to be careful here. I hope I didn't say it was a figment of the imagination. No, what it was they, my term. Okay. What, what they said was, and in meeting with the rating agencies that I just went through, and governors do that, we go down and make sure that our bond ratings are strong and, it were, and that they know how we are managing our budgets. And what they said in two of the three rating agencies is, when I asked about this question, that they feel like the doom and gloom about pensions of the States is greatly exaggerated for political reasons that they don't think any States are going bankrupt, that they don't think it is the State's biggest challenges, and that they are puzzled by the current perceived crisis. Now, in much of our discussion today about defined contribution, what is missing is the fact that uh, the taxpayers have to pay 50 percent of that pension benefit every single month regardless. And in a defined benefit plan, as you pointed out, 80 percent of the cost is actually borne by the uh, growth uh, that the investments receive. The taxpayers then end up only paying about 20 percent. Is that not correct? That is correct. And another point that is important to remember is that, which I mentioned earlier, but I want to make sure it is emphasized, that in this financial crisis, we have asked our public employees, our unionized employees, to pay more. Both our teachers and State employees have agreed to pay more, to increase the share that they are paying. And somehow that is getting lost in the, in the, between the trees here. Uh, the fact of the matter is, yes, you are correct, 80 percent of payments come from investments in the fund. And second, we have asked our employees and they have agreed to pay more than they were paying pre-crisis. So we are balancing this crisis to some degree on their backs. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady, and I uh, thank uh, Governor Walker and Governor Shumlin for being here. I'm I'm up next. It was uh, I, I I I accept that. Um, no, we're not closing, and I'm just uh, allowing the chairman a, a vote opportunity in Judiciary Committee, as uh, I was uh, voting and chairing a subcommittee. I was dealing with a non-controversial issue, and I apologize for not being here. Uh, Davis Bacon was what we were talking about, uh, and uh, so I, I had to be there. But I did read your your testimonies and appreciate you being here. And so I did want to ask uh, some questions, Governor Walker. I also appreciate the fact of what you build in in Milwaukee and enjoy riding my Road King. I understand you ride as well, and I've enjoyed riding both Wisconsin and in the beautiful state of Vermont. And uh, so there are days where I wish they were there right now. As a former State official uh, in the State Legislature, I am very familiar with your situation, Governor Walker. Uh, when I started my tenure back in 1982 there, um, we had a $1.8 billion budget deficit. In the process of a number of years, uh, we uh, enacted 26 tax cuts, regulatory reform, uh, a number of things that went to ultimately, when I left in 1999, we had a budget surplus, a rainy day fund of over a billion dollars. Um, uh, hasn't history repeatedly proven, proven that lowering taxes encourages economic growth 
and ultimately increases revenue for the States. Yes, we have seen that in the past, and we saw the opposite of that two years ago when my predecessor in the legislature moved to pass a budget repair bill in 24 hours that raised taxes by about a billion dollars, and we saw uh, obviously higher unemployment and job loss after that. So uh, clearly raising taxes in the economic crisis is not the right answer, and the more you put money back in the hands of job creators, I believe the better off you are going to be. Build the economy. Absolutely. Well, right now, Michigan, uh, as you know, in, in talking with yeah. our new governor, uh, we are at a $5.7 billion, billion budget shortfall. Uh, Governor Snyder is taking some aggressive steps and being pushed back as well as, as, uh, as you have experienced, including dealing with an emergency uh, manager authority over municipalities. And that leads to my question. Uh, what do you think of that type of authority and what are some other reforms that uh, may need to be pursued? in order to strengthen the fiscal standing of States uh, like your own? Well, I would have to look specifically at what Rick is proposing there in terms of oversight over local governments. I, I will tell you, though, this goes to the heart as a former county official uh, of what I am talking about and why we pushed reforms that weren't just about the momentary. They weren't just about fixing things today or even over the next two years, but about providing long-term relief. And let me be clear, because I think sometimes people confuse this into thinking this has an impact on private sector unions. It doesn't. Collective bargaining is fully intact for any of the private sector unions out there. This legislation that we signed the law doesn't have an impact on that for the, for the public sector. To be able to make changes that ensure stability, financial stability in governments at the State and the local level, we had to make these changes. And even more so to make sure that government can continue to be reformed and where we can improve the system and ultimately reward good employees. Uh, that also was a part of this package as well. So in totality, I, I believe we give local governments the kind of long-term tools they need not only to balance their budgets, but to make prudent decisions so they can protect core services. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, well, let me, I was going to ask both governors, but uh, uh, let me continue my questioning here at this point. Um, what steps can Governor Walker, uh, or should not, I guess the positive and the negative, uh, what steps can or should not Congress do to help you in your budget situation? Um, and I guess following up with that, do you agree that another State bailout is not the solution? Well, to me, asking the taxpayers, me as a Federal uh, taxpayer, which uh, obviously we reminded of this week, um, asking me to bail out another State isn't something I am particularly interested in as a taxpayer. To me, I think each of us in each of the 50 States have to make, in many cases, the tough decisions uh, to ensure that we not only balance our current budgets, but we make long-term decisions. And if we look to other people at the Federal level or other entities to do that, I think that puts us in a very precarious, uh, very precarious position. One other thing, if I might digress for just one second from your question, the gentleman from Massachusetts, and I apologize, I think his name played his term, but, but asked me a question about process. And one thing that's just important to put in the record, uh, we didn't start the debate the way that has been characterized. In December, after the elections, but before I was sworn in the office, the public sector unions in the State rushed to the lame duck session of the legislature and to the governor and tried to pass through contracts uh, that would have locked us into a more dire uh, financial situation with costs that I believe we couldn't account for with a $3.6 billion deficit uh, on the horizon. So that was the initial act. Now, we were successful in appealing even to some of the Democrats in the legislature to stop that from happening and giving us a chance to do that. But when people ask why didn't we begin by negotiating, it was really the, the tone was set early on uh, by the process that was taken before, we, after the election, but before we were sworn in. And that is why it became clear to us that we needed to, to empower both our State and our local government to make those sorts of long-term changes. I thank the Governor. And uh, now we'll turn to uh, Ms. Mahoney, and I thank you for putting up with the confusion that went on there. Well, thank you, and thank you for your very thoughtful questions. And welcome, uh, Governor. I thank you for your testimony and for being with us here today. Uh, Governor Walker, uh, many, many unions and some elected officials, including uh, some Republican governors, have criticized your actions as e extreme, uh, referring to them as some sort of a fringe uh, effort to, to uh, attack workers' rights and dismantle unions. 
And how do you respond to these criticisms? Do you feel your actions were extreme or out of the mainstream in any way? No, uh, because I believe fundamentally if what we have heard said over and over again was a fundamental right, you all in Congress would be acting on it right now. Mm -hmm. You do not have collective bargaining other than postal service workers for the vast majority of public employees who work for the Federal Government for wages and for benefits. If it is a fundamental right, why aren't you debating it right here now? It is not. Mm -hmm. It is a government entitlement. Collective bargaining is important for the private sector. For the examples we have heard about the impact it has had on families and legacies, Private sector unions are my partner in economic development. I work with them, and I hope to work with our public employees. Okay. But collective bargaining itself is not a fundamental right. Rights come from the Constitution, and nowhere in the Constitution does that clearly define that. Well, many of the criticism does come from unions, but I have a stack of editorials here from major papers across the country, and I would like to go through some of the headlines. Uh, we have the Chicago Sun-Times, and its editorial says, Cut pensions, but don't bust unions. Uh, we have the Philadelphia Inquirer, and it says, A bridge too far. Uh, the Los Angeles Times says, and I quote, Wrong in Wisconsin. And the Boston Globe, uh, its headline says, By overreaching, Wisconsin Governor hinders reforms in all states. I, I even have some editorials from your own uh, state's papers, the Milwaukee, Wisconsin Journal, the Centennial, and the Green Bay Press Gazette. I, I, I would like to uh, read from a few of these and, and get your response. The Philadelphia Inquirer calls your actions, and I quote, a partisan plot masquerading as fiscal prudence, end quote. The New York Times says, and I quote, even when unions have made concessions, Republican officials have kept up the attack. The Republicans claim to be acting on behalf of taxpayers, and this is not believable. The LA Times says your claim, and I quote, that public employee unions must be crushed in order to balance the State's budget is deeply disingenuous. And the Milwaukee, Wisconsin Journal Centennial writes, and I quote, that unions have conceded on benefits, but parts of Walker's budget repair bill unfairly targets collective bargaining for public employees. Even the, the Green Bay Press Gazette, I knew a newspaper that I believe endorsed you when, you when you ran for governor, says your approach, and I quote, casts the debate as an anti-union campaign and not a tough but fair uh, shared sacrifice. So what is your reaction to these statements by respected papers across our country? Sure. Thank you for your question. I would point out two things. One, just a, a factual error that uh, a couple of those papers alluded to, and, and I mentioned before, the unions did not reach settlements. Uh, two, public, or two public employee unions made a statement, neither of which was codified in any agreement and none of which but, were But, Governor, um, this was not referring to those specifics. It no, I will answer your other part. But, about but that. May, may I finish, uh, because my time is expiring? Uh, I, I believe the point that they made in these editorials is the same point that many of us on this panel have been trying to make today. And, and we are trying to make the point that it is one thing to ask for a shared sacrifice for financial reasons, but it is uh, very unfair. And uh, you appear to be trying to strip American workers of their rights. And, and there does not seem to be any uh, financial rationale at all. That is what these editorials are making. Sure. Instead, it, it appears uh, very much to me and to others to be ideologically and, and politically motivated. Per, per your original question, I would say many of those same voices said the same thing about Mitch Daniels in 2005. My he, after expired. his time, uh, in office, after people saw the benefits of the collective bargaining reforms he put in place, 
uh, where government got more efficient, more effective, more accountable, and where ultimately public employees who were doing a great job got rewarded, the people in his state reelected him with 58 percent of the vote. I think it is because they recognized results. They wanted results, and that is what they got. I thank the gentlelady. We now recognize the former chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, may I put these editorials in the book? In the, uh, Without record? objection, so order. Additionally, the earlier unanimous consent for Mr. Connolly is, uh, is accepted, so his will also be placed in the record. Well, my uh, Governor, you right. can't run we, out on me now. I was going to say something nice about you. Congressman Burton, he's going to be right back. And, and we just. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take a two minute recess. <laughs> okay. I was going to say something nice. That shows you the influence I have.